You are live now. A very good evening to one and all of you to our ARC webinar on update series on Fakic IOLs. And I'm very sure that having heard the earlier comments that it's definitely be going to be a feast of mind and we are going to delve into some of those areas which might have not got covered earlier on. And we have the greatest set of uh, expert panel with us and some wonderful speakers who are going to really have us all tied to our seats. We have on our expert panel, Dr. Kamal Kapoor, who's the founder and medical director of Sharpsight uh, Center and its uh, amazing group of hospitals, a surgeon of great skill sets and a great presence in the national and international ophthalmology. We have with us joining soon, Dr. Ram Murthy, who is the chairman of the Eye Foundation Group of Hospitals, past president, a very prolific surgeon with his list of awards and accolades. We have with us, joining soon, our immediate past president, Dr. Mahipal Sajdev, who is the chairman and MD of the Center of Side Group of Hospitals, who has made a huge difference as a president in his term with the great measures he took to keep peers delivering the best from all fronts. We have with us joining Dr. Rajesh Sina, who's a professor of ophthalmology in Cornea Lens and Refractive Surgery Services, RP Center, uh, an honorary treasurer and an individual of great standing. We have with us <coughs> Edward Dynamic, Dr. Partha Bishwas, director of uh, BBI Foundation, Kolkata, and his new uh, yeah, hospital, and a chair, chair, uh, uh, chairman scientific committee of AOS with the versatility and dynamism and an originality of his own and a figure to reckon in Indian ophthalmology. We have with us Dr. Purendra Vaseen, who's a founder and medical director of Pratham Jyoti Netralia at Gwalior, an entrepreneur who has also managed a multi-specialty center of great excellence, a very versatile surgeon with very honorous post in Madhya Pradesh Ophthalmic Society. Moderating with me is Dr. Anaga Harul, who is the medical director of her Anil Eye Hospital, member ARC West, a surgeon with great skill sets. Without wasting time, we shall go on to our first speaker. And we're going to actually start with a the debate, which is going to set the whole fire to the whole webinar. And the debate would be started off by Anaga, who is going to tell us when she would go for faking IOs. And she is going to be challenged by Dr. Uh, uh, Nareen Shetty, who would tell when he would say no to fake IOLs too. On to you, Anaga. Yeah. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, am I audible, ma'am? Yeah, yeah. 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 Really sorry that my video is not working. Uh, nevertheless, very good evening to everyone and thank you so much at the outset for giving me an opportunity to speak on this. So my topic is when fake IOLs no financial interest in any of the products. Uh, myopia today is a public health crisis in waiting and by 2050 it is predicted that nearly 50% of the world's population would be affected by myopia. And as the amount of myopia goes on increasing, the associated problems like cataracts, glaucoma, retinal detachments and myopic macular degeneration will also increase. But today what we are going to focus is the dependence on glasses in all these patients and how we as ophthalmologists and as refractive surgeons can make their life easier, especially with lenticular-based refractive surgeries. So when we speak of fake IOLs, what we need to do is a proper case selection, precise surgical technique, good counseling, and excellent post-operative care. So the first and foremost thing is to have a stable, perfect refraction. And when we go ahead and advise these patients about fake IOL, we need to ensure that there is no overcorrection, especially in these very high myopes. Do not oversell, especially in the lower myopes. If LASIK is not possible and if they are in their late 30s or early 40s, sometimes they'll be well off uh, without doing any refractive surgery. The anterior chamber depth, most importantly, from the corneal endothelium and not the epithelium to the anterior lens capsule should be more than 2.8 millimeters. Now, when ICL was approved for uh, fake uh, IOLs, it, the US FDA approval was from minus 3 to minus 15 diopters in 2005. And for astigmatism, it came into a, a play by 2018 for 1 to 4 diopter cylinder. But the CE approval was from 0.5 to minus 18 diopters 
in 1997 and from 0.5 to 6 cylinder in 2003 so as we are going to discuss later on we do a complete refractive surgery work up including a topography tomography so when you want to decide about whether a patient should undergo fake coil or not you look at the slit lamp look at the anterior chamber configuration especially if there is a family history of glaucoma ensure that the ocular surface is good do a lens thickness and a biometry completely intraocular pressure measurement anterior chamber angle disc and a specular biomicroscopy should show a uh, adequate endothelial cell count so the basic thing is the patient should be at least 18 or 21 years many times we consider for fake kuls this as uh, a refraction should be stable over at least one year and in all those patients where corneal based surgeries like advanced surface ablation or lasik is not possible either because of the very high refractive error or a thin cornea with a low uh, residual stromal bed are indications for a fake kul yes here we need to consider how we adhere to the law of thicknesses yes today uh, we consider around 300 microns for the residual stromal bed and we need to reduce the risk of post operative keratectasia might be keeping a post operative corneal thickness of more than 400 microns would be a good idea we also know that today a low corneal thickness itself has been found to be a risk factor if you look at the randleman scoring system a uh, very uh, young patient with a low uh, corneal thickness especially less than 500 with a lower residual stromal bed will going to be a very high risk for lasik and then we would decide to do a fake kul also if it's a very flat cornea and if it's a high refractive error making the cornea even more flat would lead to poor post operative optics glare halos and poor night vision and here fake kul would be the better option now for example here we have a patient where in the right eye the minus 9 minus 1 cylinder and left eye is minus 5 with a borderline corneal thickness of around 500 so in the left eye we went ahead and did a lasik procedure this is the post operative corneal topography report which shows the central myopic ablated area in the left eye and in the right eye we went ahead and did a fake kul now this is a post op total eye aberrometry of the same patient and you can see in both the eyes the refractive a correction has been done but if you also see the higher order aberrations are comparable whereas had we gone ahead and done a lasik in the right eye it would have caused a very high positive corneal spherical aberration and poor quality of vision in the right eye we would also consider the percentage tissue altered we all know that pti is the flap thickness plus ablation depth divided by the central corneal thickness and if it's more than 0.4 or 40% it would be a high risk and in all these cases fake kul would be better we need to stress that the retina has to be considered very very strongly and barrage laser done in case of lattice degeneration in peripheral degenerations if there are any changes in the oct this has to be considered is also you can use it as a piggy back lens for pseudo fake residual refractive errors instead of a sulcoflex renal lens off label indications include stable non progressive keratoconus more details will be there in few of the talks thereafter and after keratoplasty this picture shows how a fake kul has been used in a patient with intracorneal rings after the refraction and the topography has been stabilized this was an article which showed how intracorneal residual refractive error uh, had good outcomes with a toric uh, fake kul so in any case where there is an anterior segment or a posterior segment ocular pathology obviously we would not use a fake kul here we have compared the ipcl with the icl and uh, the ipcl is relatively harder so it's easier to handle and it's more aspheric and probably we don't need to uh, rotate it because the ipcl is always aligned at 0 180 degrees in the toric case whereas the icl you need to rotate so all you need to do is calculate the lens and have the lens power calculation and use the implantation orientation diagram most importantly you need to counsel these patients regarding realistic expectations explain the procedure how different it is from lasik potential complications especially of cataract raised intraocular pressure and in the presbyopic age group explain to them the need for near vision correction or the option of presbyopic fake kuls so these okay. options need to be discussed with these patients in our experience we have found right from minus 2.5 to more than 20 diopters excellent results we evaluate them first day one week one month three months six months year lead post op with ucda bcda iop walt lens retina and the higher order aberrations we have found that no patient actually lost lines 
no significant iop rise or cataract uh, uh, you know, as a post operative complication so finally to summarize the most important advantages are, is a better quality of vision as there is no significant induced hair or aberrations a small corneal incision which actually does not induce any astigmatism as the corneal tissue is not removed there is no risk of ectasia it's closer to the nodal point and hence there is a gain in the retinal size image greater effective optical zone it is a reversible procedure unlike lasik and there is no fixation into the tissues so it's an excellent tool but you need to do a detailed pre operative workup precise surgical technique close post operative monitoring to get excellent results and happy patients so finally refractive surgery especially fake eyeballs is about care more care and even more care thank you so much for your kind attention thank you thanks <clears throat> anagha uh, that was a, a succinct information you gave can we have dr naren shetty also presenting his uh, when he would not uh, advise a fake eyeball before we go on to a brief uh, set of questions dr naren yeah thank you so much ma'am uh, let me just uh, share my screen ma'am one sec Hello everyone. On the sunset, I would like to thank AOS for giving me this opportunity. Today, I'm going to talk about when not to do. A We do can't hear you now. It's not with surgery. Uh, Fake eye implants has really gained popularity. Now, there are many indications to implant a fake eye oil. Uh, other than just a virgin eye, you can also use them post refractive, post post linking, even stable keratoconus, post keratoplasty, and uh, in uh, piggy bag IOLs in cataract post cataract surgery. But let's talk about what's a good surgeon. A good surgeon knows how to operate. A better surgeon knows when to operate, and the best surgeon knows when not to operate. <laughs> So let's look at when not to do a fake IOL implant. There are many uh, contraindications uh, in implanting a fake IOL. Uh, so let's go one uh, one by one. Now, one of the things are uh, age. When the age is less than uh, 21, that is the avoid because usually the power is not stable. And if you go and try to avoid implanting these lenses beyond 50 years, uh, because usually some amount of cataract changes are there, also determining endothelial cell count and lens thickness and so on and so forth. Now the other thing we really need to look uh, look at is the endothelium. <clears throat> When we have corneal endothelial count less than uh, 2,500 at 20 years, it's better to avoid. And also, if the count is uh, less than 2,000 at uh, 40 years, again, it's better to avoid implanting these lenses. Now, anterior chamber depth is one of the most talked about uh, factor when you're implanting a fake IOL. And uh, usually, it's better to keep a cutoff of uh, less than 2.8 uh, millimeters uh, of uh, anterior chamber depth. Uh, that is, if you're, uh, you know, uh, calculating from the endothelium to the anterior surface of the lens. But uh, if you're planning to start your fake uh, IOL implant practice now, it's better to keep a cutoff of uh, 3 millimeters. But I personally uh, use uh, less than 2.75 millimeters as my cutoff. But we shouldn't only look at the central ACD. We should not forget the periphery also. This is one of the things which normally all of us keep forgetting is to do gonio. So if the angle is less than thirty degrees, better to avoid because there's a higher risk of uh, angle closure, glaucoma, or surgery. Also, look for signs of any kind of inflammation in the eye, be it uh, you know uh, telltale signs or even active uh, signs. If you see any of these traces, better to avoid implanting these lenses. Now the next thing is you have to look at the iris structure. If you see any ciliary body, uh, I mean sorry, ciliary uh, iris cyst, it is not a contraindication. But when you see multiple cysts in multiple quadrants, you need to be very very cautious. Also look at the iris configuration. If there's any abnormality uh, in the uh, iris configuration, it can lead to uh, again angle closure glaucoma because of abnormal adhesion of the lens and further closure uh, of the angles, and uh, you can end up with. a uh, lot of issues post surgery 
Uh, pupil size is something that normally uh, all of us don't look at. Uh, always look for uh, pupil size. And if you have a mesotic uh, pupil size more than six millimeters, it's better to avoid uh, fakic ions. Uh, uh, there are different uh, uh, companies which give you a larger optical, uh, uh, optical size. They really customize to your needs. Uh, but generally, I think it's better to have a good uh, cutoff of mesotic pupil of uh, more than six millimeters because this can lead to a lot of tails and flowers. Now, you, you have to keep in mind also, depending on the power that is a power of the IOL which is being implanted, the size of the lens can and the size of the optic can change. So keep that in mind and uh, then plan for the surgery. Now, cataract is one of uh, a major factor which you shouldn't implant. But if it is a developmental cataract or a non-progressive one, you can still implant uh, 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 well. but if it is a clinical significant uh, cataract in the visual axis and also uh, if, it, uh, if it is present in the presbyopic age, better to avoid phakic IOLs. The next is the retina. If you see uh, cases where we have myopic uh, CNVM or stage 2 or above macular holes, better to avoid implanting these lenses. But if in the but if you see in the periphery a uh, few lattice and degeneration uh, or holes or breaks, you can always do barrage lasers and after two weeks you can take up for the surgery. One of the things also we need to keep in mind is if the patient is uh, has a, a lot of uh, liking for laser surgeries and not very keen, please do not push uh, the patient towards uh, fake IOLs. Or if they're not if they're not at all interested with fake IOLs, please don't do it at all. That is one of the uh, contraindications also that we need to put in that in our list. So what we need to do at the end, uh, end of this full good discussion, we really, really need to sit with the patient, explain to the uh, patient all the pros and cons, and uh, make sure the patient has more realistic expectations. So let's look at a few cases. Here's the first case where we have a 30-year-old uh, old lady coming uh, coming for a focus surgery who has minus 10 and minus 2 cylinder in the right eye and minus 9 and minus 1.5 cylinder in the left eye. Uh, with the 6x six, six, uh, 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 parts best corrected vision, uh, patient has a clear, uh, clear lens and the fundus uh, is all within the normal limits. This is how the topo looked at. But when we look closer at the scans, we realize the pentacam picked up uh, the, the PNS of 1. So that means in some, you know, in, a, in our busy OPD, there's a very high chance that we can miss out uh, these subtle changes of cataract in the lens. So please take your time when you uh, see in the slit lamp, make sure you don't miss out these uh, small things because once you're done with the surgery, then you explain to the patient that you already had preoperative cataract, the patient will not be convinced at all. So the next thing is, uh, this is uh, case two. Here's a 28-year-old uh, gentleman who came for the active surgery, who right eye had the 0.5, uh, with 6 6 vision and the left eye was minus two uh, cylinder with 6 6 vision. So um, uh, the patient uh, had the clear lens and myopia on the, the fundus was perfectly normal. Now, this is the topo uh, topography, and the patient wasn't suitable, suitable for any of the laser procedures. So, what do we do? Do we implant the fakic IOL? No. We need to monitor these kind of patients and we, we need to make sure that the KC is stable. So when the, the KC is unstable, then you do a fake lens, then you will end up with uh, trouble because there's a lot more treatment required to stabilize the cornea when you have a KC. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Nare. So let's start off with a great talk. Um, let's start off with just a few questions. Uh, I think I'll take the first question with Dr. Kamal. Are you there, Dr. Kamal? Yes, yes, I'm there, very much there. Now, this is something uh, we might transgress, if at all, but I don't think we should. Uh, uh, AC depth of 2.7 millimeters, would you suggest a fakic IOL? Does okay, the now, I think, I think at 2.8 also is not the actual cutoff. I think what matters is the lens rise that I have, the angles that I have, and if I'm operating a hypermetrope, then even 2.8 is not my cutoff. I would rather have a cutoff of three millimeters because a hyperopic lens is shaped and designed far more differently than a myopic concave back lens. So 
the 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 golden rule of 2.8 probably doesn't hold true yes but i think when we are talking on these forums we are responsible for a lot of audience who are listening to us so having a 2.8 cut off is a safe cut off but one word of caution for beginner is if you're going to treat a hyper rope do not think below 3 mm look for lens rise and look for angles that's one number 2 if you're looking at a keratoconus patient 2.8 is again not your bandwidth because in keratoconus patients a lot of times if it is a central steepening of the cornea with the fruste or or a central steepening you may get a false anterior chamber depth whereas suddenly it has a stashaling effect so i i remember you must remember in last session we had on this where i did present two cases like that anterior chamber depth was 2.8 and everything looked looked normal but the patient totally you know behaved contrary to what we were expecting so 2.8 is a good mark for normal standard cases very flat corneas 2.8 not good idea keratoconus patients 2.8 not a good idea hyperopic patients 2.8 not a good idea but yes i have operated at 2.65 also in patients who been kindly observed i have counseled them that okay this is we are trying this if it works out great if it doesn't you will be ready we might have a cataract and i've got away with it but you cannot do that every time so i think 2.8 for a normal standard case with your standard keratometries good angles good lens rise not high lens rise more than 600 microns these would be few borderline cases where i would stick to the dictum of 2.8 otherwise i would like to use more levers to find where i stand proper okay <clears throat> dr ramurthy i would want to ask you continuing on this would you think a 2.8 uh 2.7 and you think you can get away by doing a yag pi does it make any sense at all dr ramurthy are you there yeah, yeah yeah i'm there i'm there uh no 2.8 is what i go by even for hyperopic eyes if it's 2.8 mm or more we go with that we don't go less than that and most of these lenses whether it's indian or imported comes with a centra flow now which is central opening in these cases i think doing a pa doesn't really add much to much value so if that's not going to work uh, so i stick uh, strictly by 2.8 and also give some credence to the angle if it is less than 30 degrees then that's again a relative contraindication but unlike uh, i would agree with most of what uh, kamal said only thing is uh, even in hyperopic eyes i am aware of the difference in the profile of the lenses in uh, myopic eyes is basically uh <clears throat> plano concave while this is uh, uh, plano convex in hyperopic eyes but in and it's slightly thicker in the periphery but still we stick to uh, 2.8 mm i have not come to grief but i don't think there's any uh, point in making a pi and saying that i compromise on the thickness and the ac depth and i think oh, it is I... most important that we do a look at the angle and an angle may be not necessary 30 even up to 25 you could uh, Uh, allow an open angle, and you could uh, go ahead. And uh, a yag PI is after all done for a pupillary block. It is not that uh, allows you to justify stepping down on your AC depths at all. And with a central flow, where is the question of a pupillary block occurring? Taking you to a different uh, setting, a 35-year-old pre-presbyopic with a three diopter par, with good AC depth. I would want Dr. Purendra Basin and Partha to comment on this. a 35 year old with a plus 3 diopter par with a good ac depth would you talk of a fake iol or would you consider a clear lens extraction plus 3 diopters uh plus 3 diopters 35 years old i will prefer uh, if the anterior chamber depth is adequate then i will prefer doing fake iol um in such cases because she still have 5 years in hand where she can be spectacle free she will not require press biopic lenses and uh, had the refractive error very high like uh, seven adapters eight adapters or like that then i would have gone for a uh, thought for a uh, uh, refractive lens exchange and with uh, multifocal or trifocal lens but in this case i will prefer going for a uh, uh of uh, the fake lens if the anterior chamber depth is adequate 
Why would no, you? I would, I would. You are not anyway looking at a press biopic eye oil. So how does it matter if it's LASIK uh, or a pegic eye oil? Why? Why would you not prefer a LASIK for a plus three diopter? Oh, uh, less it uh, if it is corneal thickness is adequate then definitely because the question was uh, uh, hyperopic if it is uh, uh, then we can go for LASIK definitely LASIK is a good option second option will be fake lens that is so. first option is LASIK uh, uh, Partha no thought on it. Let's ensure that a, a hyperopic uh, phakic IOL doesn't have the center of flow. So would that sort of deter you to consider a phakic IOL or would you still do uh, LASIK or you would still do phakic IOL? Your thoughts? Plus three, I would definitely, my first choice would be LASIK. If uh, LASIK is not possible, then only it would be phakic IOL. I would not do, like to do a clear lens extraction for a 35-year-old with a plus three. Okay. But then, if the third kind of scenario comes in, wherein it's an 18-year-old here with a plus four diopters, so would you wait or what would be your approach? Otherwise, any of you expert panel could take that. Definitely, with an 18-year-old uh, with a hyperopia, it's very judicious to wait at least... Um, one or two more years with proper cycloplegic refraction every time, every six months. And when one is absolutely sure that the hyperopia is stable, then going for the uh, laser vision correction. Ramuti, you want to add anything? Yeah, just a comment here. You know, uh, hyperopia doesn't progress in the sense that myopic eyes become larger. So you want to wait till 21. In hyperopia, the it's a smaller eye. It's not going to become any more any smaller further. The only challenge here is to the difference between what is manifest hyperopia, what the patient accepts, and what is the actual hyperopia. So doing a good cycloplasic refraction with homotropin is extremely important, and also pushing the patient to accept as much plus power as possible is important. In case the uh, under cycloplasic refraction what you find is there is six, plus six diopters and the patient is not, uh, even after fogging, is not able to accept beyond 3.5 diopters, I'd hold my hands. It's not because the hyperopia is not going to be progressive, but because the patient is at this point of time is not going to be comfortable with a full correction. So I would go as much as putting about uh, 4.5 or so, even though the patient might have a certain, uh, initially a certain problem, as the accommodation relaxes over time, you would find that the patients are accepting quite well. So if there is more than a diopter, diopter and a half of difference between the patient's acceptance and what is uh, measured by a objective cycloplegic refraction, I'd hold my hands as far as uh, uh, putting in fake intraoc lenses in hyperopia is concerned. Dr. Sri Ganesh, are you there? Dr. Sri Ganesh? Not there. Dr. Tithyal, would you want to add something at this point? I think the point is well you know, uh, discussed, uh, nothing much to add. We all understand, you know, refractive procedure needs to be uh, assessed as per the requirement of patient. There are people, hyperopes will always demand a you know, removal of glasses. And uh, given an option, I think uh, LASIK or laser vision correction will be the first choice in these cases. Unless they, as uh, Purin rightly you know, told, if the refractive is very high, then you can go for a clear lens extension. And uh, high pros do accept these you know, options very, very nicely as compared to myopic patients. Uh, Anaga, would you want to add anything to it? I just wanted to uh, ask the panel regarding their uh, choice whether is it 18 years complete or 21 years complete for a fake IOL even in a myopic patient? Yes, stable stable refraction for yeah, one stable year. Refraction, assuming stable refraction, would you consider that is the first criteria. minus 20? No, sir, that's why. If assuming that it is a stable refraction, say minus 20 diopters, would you consider at 18 complete or 21 complete? She's I, it, it depends, you know, if, if it is a uh, male uh, counterpart, <laughs> then 21 is a cutoff. If it's a female, uh, you can go for 18 years. 
How is that? So, but it's true. Assuming that she is not going to get married. <laughs> no, no, no. I think uh, the no, 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 is... not like that. Yeah, it depends on our really? totally reflective really? stabilization. Yeah. The, uh, one other factor I would just like to mention is you know nowadays we are more concerned about the regression after laser vision correction also even in a 24 year old maybe the patient comes with a minus eight diopters uh, cornea is very thick everything is quite normal what i have found over the years is that whether you do smile or whether you do femtolasic after four five six years many of these patients start developing a small amount of residual uh, error small regression that comes up so some patient who repeatedly keeps asking uh, or the, whether the correction that you are going to do is going to be absolutely fine. I tend to ship more towards fake intraoc lenses because it's like putting a perfect glasses inside and it serves the patient very well till they become presbyopic. Second thing is about the quality of vision. Even though we have so many different nomograms and then laser vision correction, there's always a certain drop in the quality of vision when we go on to higher amounts of refractive error, both hypropia and myopia. So if that matters a lot to the patient, again, I tend to go for fake intraocular lenses because there's no distortion of the cornea that you do with the, uh, by a fake intraocular lens. So we shall now go on to our next group. I would want Dr. Vardhaman Kankaria to give his first talk and then followed by Shreyesh and then we take the discussions. So Dr. Vardhaman Kankaria, as we all know, has a premium practice after a dual fellowship from US and Europe and a very leading refractive cataract surgeon, a young one from Pune. And he's going to talk on a very quintessential topic, pre-op evaluation in fake IOLs. And I think that's an extremely critical topic. He will be followed up by Dr. Shresh Ramuti, who's a consultant cataract cornea and refractive services at the Eye Foundation Group of Hospitals, a young, very versatile surgeon who's going to talk on something as important, that is sizing of fake IOLs. So let's hear from Vardhaman first. On to you. Vardhaman, unmute yourself. Yes. Right. Thank you so much, ma'am. I hope I'm audible. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So first of all, thank you so much to Dr. Chitra ma'am and the team ARC uh, for the kind invitation. Um, actually, both Dr. Narain and Dr. Anaga has made my job very easy because they have covered a lot of aspects of when to choose, how to choose, and when to avoid the fake lenses uh, in this regard. So now I'm, what I'm going to talk to you about is going to be how do we evaluate these patients. So uh, back in 1997, which we will say as one of the earlier days of laser refractive surgery, the percentage of moderate to high uh, myopes uh, who were coming for evaluation of refractive surgery were seen to be 10 times to 16 times more than the lower myopes because till that time, the let us say the safety of the laser vision correction was not truly established. Over the years, what we have seen is now, now uh, the high myopes have probably come to now 10 to 15% to 20% of our refractive evaluations overall. And with the current armamentarium of the laser refractive surgery that we have with the corneal lasers, such as uh, with the today's generation of um, the advanced surface ablation, smile, femtolasic, contour vision laser procedures, the current generation of fake lenses, such as EVO ICLs and some of the very good uh, quality Indian lenses, and also in very select patients, the refractive lens exchange. So actually our evaluation should cover the entire aspect and the armamentarium of the refractive surgical patients when they come to us. Uh, what we understand now is that a routine evaluation of refractive surgery has the aim to choose the eligible patients for the right technology, to also understand the prognosis and the future course of these patients, and to avoid possible complications. A routine evaluation of refractive surgery, surgery patient involves, uh, of course, uh, history taking refraction, intraocular pressures, adnexal evaluation, slit lamp evaluation uh, to look at the anterior chamber, peripheral retinal evaluation to uh, avoid uh, peripheral retinal uh, uh, issues in the future, dry workup, especially in corneal laser procedures, the pupillometry, corneal tomography, and axial length as a baseline to look at also the future course or uh, in case if we look at uh, regression or progressive myopia. However, I'm going to uh, limit myself to the special considerations which are for evaluation of the fake lenses itself. Uh, we are going to talk about about nine different aspects uh, out of which the first six or seven are for the eligibility of the fake lenses. 
And the last uh, couple of them are mainly for the sizing issue, what is going to be dealt by Dr. Shreyas uh, in the next talk. Now, what we were discussing uh, just now in the panel discussion is about the age factor. Um, uh, we still stick to 21 years, especially large population of our fecic lenses are high myopic. So anybody who has pathological myopia more than six diapters or more than eight diapters, I think it is better that we uh, uh, wait till 21 years because the studies have shown that the eye still is going in progressive axial length uh, uh, elongation till the age of 21 years. And in some patients, we have also seen that some people, even at the age of 23 or 24 years, still they tend to progress. So it is very crucial that we actually establish a stability of refractive uh, error for at least one year. And the minimum age has to be 21 years. The age that you can extend to can be in the range of 45 to 50 years. Now, the main reason why we stick to 45 years is mainly after that, you know that there is an age-related lens rise. There is an age-related decrease in endothelial cell count, anterior chamber crowding, and increase in chance of cataract formation. So I think this is one of the reasons that we should typically stick to 45 or at max 50 years. However, the newer generations of the ICLs, including the, the presbyopic IPCL and the new ICL, which is going to come now, which is called as a Vivo ICL, are coming in presbyopic range because they are treating the presbyopic uh, errors as well, which is going to be dealt by Dr. Titi Alsar in the future. So in these situations, you can stretch it up to 60 years of age. Uh, the second one, of course, is the refractive error, the range of the correction and how you deal with that. It is very important that you uh, actually do cycloplegic refraction in each and every patient. For patients who have of extremely high emetropia, like in the range of 18 or 20 year uh, uh, myopia, diapters of myopia, you can also choose to do what is called as a contact lens over refraction that gives you much more accurate uh, refractive uh, correction. Uh, it is also important that you choose the right range of the refraction. If you talk about the star ICL, I think the current range allows you to treat myopia up to minus 19 to minus 20 diapters with a astigmatism up to 5.5 to 6 diapters. Uh, and on the lower side, I personally do not choose to do fecic lenses for patients who are less than two diapters of myopia, uh, because in a large amount of those patients actually are doing a nice uh, uh, let us say a uh, surface ablation plus procedure can also give us a good long term outcome. Uh, coming to the slit lamp examination, uh, now coming to the refractive error itself, as we know, uh, this is a paper that our group had published back in 2007, in which for minus 9.50 diopters of spherical equivalent, one I underwent LASIK, the other I underwent a ICL procedure. Over nine years of follow-up that this study reported, we have seen that in the EI of ICL, the vision was still 20-25 uncorrected. And in the eye, which had undergone LASIK, there was a regression and the vision had dropped to 20 by 60. So this is one of the reasons that we choose the uh, ICL procedures for anybody who has more than eight or nine diopters of myopia. It has a lot of advantages, including maintenance of your quality of vision, especially the night vision, less amount of uh, halos and glare, better contrast sensitivity, and less chances of recreation, apart from avoiding complications such as ectasia. Of course, when you look at the uh, slit lamp, it is important that you look at the eyelid margin and you have to be sure that there is no active blepharitis and myobomin gland dysfunction has to be treated beforehand because although the endophthalmitis also has been seen in my minority of patients, in, in many of them, it was actually related to the commensals at the eyelid margin. Uh, the cornea has to be carefully evaluated, especially if you see a patient who has a very thick cornea to rule out gatata. The idocorneal angles, anterior chamber depth evaluation, even on the slit lamp, and the clarity of the lens uh, is of paramount importance. Uh, here, I would like to just make a comment about uh, uh, the eye dress. As we know, eye dress as a device can also rule out the intra lenticular um, uh, issues, such as abrasions, and these patients are best suited for ref refractive lens exchange. Pupillary is very important and you have to make sure that your pupillary diameter is not more than the optical zone. So anybody who has more than six millimeter or 6.5 millimeters of mesopic pupillary diameter is not a good candidate for uh, fecic lenses. Now, of course, with the advent of the EVO uh, plus vision ICL, now you have a much larger optical zone. It is increased by about 0.3 millimeters and reduces your chance of halos and glare and spherical um, uh, induction of aberrations in those patients. So uh, coming to the peripheral retinal examination, it is of paramount importance. As you know, uh, you should get it done always by a um, trained retina specialist. It is if you have access to the ultra wide field retinal imaging, it is important for documentation as well as patient education. If you see any peripheral retinal lesions, 
If they are treatable, of course, you should go ahead and do a barrage lets of photocoagulation. Wait for at least two to three weeks after that, and then only you should go ahead and do a, a, a refractive surgery. If there are uh, some diseases that which are benign and do not require actually, so you any, have one minute remaining. Yes. So then you should go ahead and plan a refractive surgery uh, altogether. So there are a lot of uh, different, uh, uh, let us say, retinal complications which have been noted, but not directly related to the uh, uh, the fecal lens implantation. Uh, when it comes to the recommendation, I think any uh, symptomatic uh, horseshoe tear, operculated hole, lattice degeneration with retinal hole or with atrophic hole has to be treated promptly. The only lesion that you can still observe is there are very small asymptomatic lattice degeneration without retinal holes, but that also is better to be treated actually rather than not. So this is a couple of things that I'm just going to narrate, but I think Dr. Shreyas is going to speak more about it. I'm just going to briefly tell you about use of tomography for regularity the uh, central corneal thickness, um, ruling out ectasia and looking at the stability of ectasia and anterior chamber depth. As it has been mentioned, the anterior chamber depth has to be 3 millimeters for hyperopia and 2.8 millimeters for myopic uh, ICL procedures. Keratoconus, if established, has to be stabilized with cross-linking or should be documented to be stable before you do the IPCL procedure or ICL procedure. A specular microscopy is very, very important. You have to make sure that your specular count is uh, more than 2,200 to 2,500 in the patients who undergo the fecal lens implants. You should have a very good amount of hexagonality, more than 60%, and very less amount of coefficient of variation, uh, which is less than 40%. Coming to the sizing, uh, I think Dr. Shreyas will speak to you about it, but just to briefly tell you about it, it is very crucial that the anterior chamber depth that you measure is only from the endothelial side, and it has to be at least 2.8 millimeters. That is for eligibility. However, when you look at the total anterior chamber depth from the epithelium is required for your calculation of the ICL uh, uh, calculation per se. Uh, the white to white measurements of are very, very crucial and they can be dealt with by a variety of uh, different in instruments today. Uh, you can do either with a uh, vernil caliper, uh, which is the manual digital caliper, which is what we prefer. Uh, which is which works as a surrogate anatomy, uh, anatomical landmark, or you can also do a direct sulcus to sulcus. But it is very crucial that you it is highly operator dependent, and the vari variability of measurements can be highly there. So it is better that we stick to only white to white measurements. It is better to have at least three different uh, methods of evaluation. So we go by the auto refractometer as well as digital caliper, and with the serous uh, pentacam analysis, you can also choose the IOL master. But the studies have shown that the IL master overestimates the uh, the white to white by 0.34 millimeters and the pentacam overestimates it by 0.2 millimeters. So it's very crucial that for ideal world, you actually have to stick to the, the right measurements. So once you have reviewed your findings, make sure that you give the consent form to the patient, make sure you make them aware about all the pros and cons. Plan aerodotomies, especially if you are planning a hyperopic ICL procedure, do the online calculations. And whatever is your uh, like uh, method of choice for your fake lens, you go ahead and implant them. I'm sure this is one of the most satisfying surgeries that you'll ever perform in your life. And uh, this is a highly, highly, uh, let us say, uh, 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 satisfying procedure for the patients as well. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thanks, Vardaman. That was a, a great talk. Shall we hear Shreyas? Then we'll go on. Can you share your screen, Shreyas? So at the outset, I would like to thank uh, everyone at ARC for this uh, kind invitation. So today I'll be speaking to you all about uh, some of the critical factors, some of the challenges that we face with uh, the sizing of fake IOLs and uh, what we need to do. I think everyone uh, in this uh, panel, all my uh, co-speakers, and I'm sure everyone practicing fake IOL surgery would agree that it is perhaps one of the simplest surgeries that we perform on a, a daily basis. But the success of the surgery, uh, the complications, the challenges are almost always due to uh, challenges with the preoperative uh, parameters and the measurements that we have taken. While there are a lot of important parameters, some which have already been alluded to, things like sulcus to sulcus, which is possibly very important, which is where actually we are implanting the lens, angle to angle measurements, the or angle opening distances, and the lens rise as well. But while these parameters are important and it's nice to know all these factors, unfortunately, even today, white to white and AC depth are perhaps the only two uh, parameters which are taken into the nomogram calculations of most uh, fake IOL manufacturers even today. 
the challenges here with regard to fake oil challenging is what with the fake oil implantation is that while we are putting in the lens in the sulcus uh, we are measuring the white to white which the, like dr vardhaman uh, rightly mentioned is a surrogate measure white to white does not correlate with the sulcus to sulcus diameters and multiple studies have already shown this central ac depth also does not correspond to peripheral ac depth so while angle more than 30 degrees has been mentioned we don't have exact nomograms of what a peripheral ac depth should be all our cutoffs 2.8 3 mm whatever you follow is all dependent on the central ac depth and we've also seen that a patient can have uh, the same measurement same white to white same uh, anterior chamber depth but have different vault measurements due to uh, various other factors at the same time having a similar vault this patient can have a narrow angle in one patient and a wide open angle in the other patient so same vault but different angles so these are some of the limitations that we have day to day when it comes to these two critical factors white to white and ac depth though it's the white to white which becomes even more important because even a 0.2 mm variability can cause a shift in the size of lens which has to be selected fortunately with ac depth the variability is less because the vast majority of our patients are going to fall between the 2.8 to 3.4 uh, uh, ac depth and for a vast majority it will not create a significant change in the size uh, but it's the white to white which becomes even more critical and with the advent of these indian lenses which we have in 0.25 mm sizing uh, where you can just increase it by 0.25 to get your adequate vault that it becomes even more critical to have white to white adequately measured anterior chamber depth is important uh, most devices measure it very well just suffice to say that uh, the asoct alone tends to overestimate it a little bit if you're using the caliper but otherwise most other instruments are quite good for white to white digital caliper continues to remain the gold standard it's cost effective but the only challenge is the repeatability this is one such study which has been long uh, done long back and has shown that between two uh, uh, inter observer variation can be as high as 0.5 with regards to the caliper but with the automated devices like your obscan pentacam iol master the differences are much smaller so it's really time that we started slowly shifting from digital calipers to automated measurements the challenge with the digital caliper itself is that the white to white measurement depends on identifying the middle of the limbus accurately now when the patient is not very uh, does not have a very well pigmented limbus identifying the middle of the limbus the blue zone all of this becomes challenging and it can definitely lead to errors the other uh, issue is unless you're really taking the patient under a operating microscope uh, just under a slit lamp the you have difficulties in measuring the uh, uh, using the caliper as well and very often some people resort to just making the patient lie down and doing it under the naked eye again that gives a greater variability in the measurements uh, like i already mentioned ac depth is much more consistent across measurement devices only the asoct tends to overestimate it white to white while the differences are statistically insignificant you can see this particular paper all these measurements were told statistically insignificant but does that mean they uh, can they be used interchangeably when you just look at the mean results of a large number of patients the mean becomes statistically insignificant but when you actually look at the variability of the measurement now a greater than 0.5 mm of variability was found in a high number of patients so this goes on to say that there is a great number of outliers which either exceed or are uh, lower in terms of the measurements although the mean may not be statistically uh, different as already mentioned while s2s might be ideal it has a uh, poor interclass correlation and poor resolution of images with our standard 50 megahertz which we use only the very high frequency like the artemis uh, has been proven to be of some use but all the standard uh, ultrasound devices that we use for ubms that we use are not uh, adequate now i'll just quickly run you all through this study which we did at our center we use six different devices uh to measure uh, various uh, measurements white to white which we use the digital caliper the topolizer the pentacam the iol master 700 and the asoct and then also we use uh, the asoct and ubm to measure the angle to angle and the ubm in sulcus to sulcus now while we know that angle to angle in sulcus to sulcus are very different from white to white we were wondering whether we could arrive at an equation which would help us correlate these two uh, measurements in a better way so the aim was really to find the correlation but not the difference 
and also to derive at an equation to make different white to white values interchangeable we looked at about 100 uh, patients who were in the refractive surgery age group and all measurements were done by a trained optometrist or by cornea fellows if you just look at the mean values just like in other studies all the mean values looked very close and uh, looked as if they could be interchangeable but if you kept the 0.2 mm as the variability limit because anything more than 0.2 mm can cause uh, a change in the size of lens that you'll choose uh, there was a certain a high degree of outliers that you could see uh, with the topolizer it was a little lesser it was more tightly packed but when we went to pentacam it was a lot more spread out as you can see in this uh, bland uh, altman plot and with the il master 700 just like in the previous papers with il master 500 as well there was a tendency for overestimation of the uh, white to white as compared to the digital caliper so we used a simple linear regression and try to uh, arrive at this particular equation where basically you plug in the value if let, let's say x is 12 that is to using your digital caliper which we used as the gold standard uh, as 12 then you plug in that value of 12 within this equation to derive the value which you would get through your pentacam topolizer or il master we applied this and tried to see what was uh, how it was making the differences now while i already mentioned topolizer was quite close to the digital caliper but in the pentacam only 2/3 of patients were within 0.2 mm when we looked at direct measurements but when we uh, included this equation and applied this equation to the values that have been measured we were able to improve from 66% to 98% of patients which had agreement between the value of digital caliper and so you have one minute remaining yeah i'll uh, close quickly so this was possibly one of the uh, best things that came out of applying this linear regression where a pentacam which is a commonly available device in most refractive practices you could now use this equation and be sure that 98% of the time that you would have a great agreement between two devices and not just rely on your manual digital so uh, as i mentioned after applying the values became a lot tighter and you can see the regression line is a Uh, uh great uh, predictability and great agreement between the devices we also wanted to analyze why the iol master did not uh, work out while you look at the comparative paired plots of uh, measurements between the manual digital and topolizer they are almost all of them are linear whereas with the iol master 700 you had these outliers which are these criss cross lines that you're seeing cutting across and this was the reason that was attributed why the iol master was still not uh interchangeable is using the manual digital caliper or the pentacam and other values we also try to uh, look at the uh, white to white and angle to angle but suffice to say even after using regression equations uh it was not uh, the predictability factor the r value was very low and the r square value was very low and we did not find it uh, conclusive so white to white uh, repeatability limitations can be overcome by using alternate uh, automated measurements and the limitations of digital white to white the inter observer variability can be reduced using linear regression equations will definitely help in improving reliability of the measurements sts and ata at this point of time are not reliable measures for predicting fakey gyal size print thank you so much for your kind attention thanks shreyas so i'm going to be asking some three four questions and anaga will be asking two and although i would be addressing these questions to expert panel both shreyash and vardhaman i'm sure you'll have been thorough when you prepared your talks so i would please want you all to chip in and contradict any of the expert panel when you have a valid reasoning so the first uh, question which i would want our audience to know and i want kamal kapoor to look at it a young practitioner who does not have access to topography for powers which are beyond the scope of laser vision correction now is he justified in doing fake ik io in these patients when he does not have a topography with him okay i think this is a very very useful uh, question for most of the beginner young ophthalmologists i think the role of topography comes more so when we are looking at you know uh, corneal suspects where we are looking at corneal pathologies and a lot of times i think with sheer sheer little bit of experience you are able to look at some potential corneal abnormalities most of these patients who come to us for refractive corrections more so for the case of medical legal because when we are doing the refractive procedure on the cornea that is the time i think corneal topography for a beginner practitioner comes in more handy 
But as you said, they are beginning practitioners. They do not probably are not probably having their own LASIK machines. So doing a fakey IOL, I think, is far more predictable rather than working on the cornea and firing laser. Two reasons: because once you are working on the cornea, which is already on the brink of being unstable, you are probably precipitating something which probably was waiting to happen or may not have happened in the near future. And secondly, when you're going for a fakey IOL procedure, you by yourself are not the one who's accelerated the process. So I guess you can work around it, provided you have a keen eye for you know power changes, power shifts, uh, shift in cylinders, shift in axes, and if you have an access to a pachymetry, ultrasonic pachymetry. So this can form a little kind of a, a, a shell or a helmet around your practice, and you can go ahead. So for a beginner practitioner who wants to get into the refractive practice, still being able to perform a fakey IOL, I think is far more safer than working on any other corneal procedure. So my answer would be yes, with a relative uh, safety net, a beginner practitioner can go for fakey IOLs, provided he has materials to do his white to white measurement, uh, standardized with an interior chamber depth measured by an ultrasonic immersion pachymeter, so all those things can add on and there are nomograms for that. They can work on it, yes. Vardaman, you have anything to add on this? Yeah, ma'am. Ma'am, I'll just close my video because my internet is a bit slow. I think um, uh, I will agree on the point that yes, I mean, in a way uh, for beginning uh, refractive surgeon, Fiki Kyle is probably slightly easier to master as compared to a corneal laser procedure. But I'll say in today's times when we have access to topographies and pentacams very easily because in majority of the cities now you have actually access in some common centers which are neutral centers. You can also send it to a friend and get back. I think that topography will be required because for your calculations of fakic lenses also you require a very, very accurate keratometry. And also you require a very accurate pachymetry because even for your internal ACD to be calculated, and also for your calculations of the fakic lenses, it should come handy. Um, I think the other methods of anterior chamber depth compared to, I think if we have to really rely, uh, it is better to rely on the internal, which is uh, minus the pachymetry on IL master or by doing a tomography rather than ultrasound because ultrasound has not been seen to be very reproducible. And here we are actually playing on very thin uh, line because even if we are 2.9 versus 2.7, our decisions can change actually in this. And in the beginning, you require surgeries which are very, very successful that will give you a lot of confidence rather than uh, probably uh, going in situations where you can have issues. So I will say that I, I will still insist that it is a must that they should get a topography done and they can always get it done from one of their friend's clinic or from a neutral center, but always get it done. Very valid uh, uh, thoughts, uh, Vardhaman. Uh, no, I, I agree with Vardhaman, but the, the question uh, given is that there is uh, no, the, the topography is not there. But yes, of course, it is available. It is, if it is available and the patient, the person can get it done from a friend or someplace, yes, why not? It always adds to your information. Yes. Sure. Agree. Any other thoughts before we go on to the next question? I just felt that uh, this is a critical point. And online, not, can I just chip in? Yes, 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 Partha. Yeah, uh, Chitra, uh, here, you know, uh, <laughs> your question was a uh, new practitioner doing his first, say, 10 fake IELTS. You know, for a new practitioner going on to the fake IELTS scenario is, again, a very, very important task for him to do correctly and as accurately as possible. Once he's in a stature where he has done 50, 100, he can twiggle with the numbers 270 microns and 200, um, the AC depth of 270 or AC depth of 280, 2.8, all these things can be twiggled with. But for the new beginner, I would definitely say a topography as well as all the parameters and rechecking the white to white with the digital, correlating it either with the Pentacam or with the IOL master is definitely, uh, you know, I would say mandatory. Because once, you know, it comes to Kamal Kapoor's, uh, uh, you know, status, he can definitely have a lot of uh, understanding of it. But in the, uh, in the earlier stages, it, is, uh, it should be mandatory for all of us to follow the total guidelines. Yes, I agree. Totally. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes. Naga. Yes. Sorry, my video is not working. Really sorry to everyone. 
Uh, just a question. I want to present a case where, see, for example, you have an IOL master reading, which the technician or the optometrist has done, which is 11.7. The digital caliper, considering we ourselves have done, because I really believe that the operating surgeon should do it, is say 11.3. And the UBM, which again is done by a second technician, is say 11.9. So 11.7, 11.3, 11.9, 11 which, and obviously we know that all of these three will not correlate. Now, which of these will you actually take and which you will, will you put into the calculator is the first question. And along I'll, with I'll this, once answer. you have put into this, I'll just complete the second part of this question. If the company gives you say 12.6 or 13.2, see, because there is a cutoff at one point where it shifts from 12.6 to straight 13.2 in ICL. Unlike in IPCL where uh, we have 0.25 increments. So here the difference is almost of 700 microns, which makes a great difference in your world. So my question to all the esteemed uh, panelists is in the first case, which would you take between 11.7, 11.3, 11.9? And how would you, because every time the company is not necessarily right, even though they use their nomogram. So many times we have found that we need to tweak it a little bit. Yes, please. Can I come in? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, I think, uh, Anaga, this is a fantastic question. I encountered this when I trained people and my optoms and my doctors to do fakie trials in all the centers. One thing is, if the variation is more than 0.2, even with the same observer, you know, let's keep the other observers out for a different system. We have a system that a second observer comes in and it's a double blind in the sense the second observer does not know what is the reading on the caliper done by the previous one. Because believe me, if I tell you what reading I got, subconsciously you will try and figure that out on a digital caliper. That's one of my personal observations. So if I did not tell my optoms or my surgeons what reading the earlier surgeon had or the earlier optom had, I tend to get a more accurate and a realistic view, number one. Number two, I have realized that apart from Pentacam, Tommy, IL Masters, somehow in my institutions, we get fantastic accuracy on white to white on my Cirrus. We use, we've started using Cirrus for calculation of white to white and our accuracies are 96%. But what we do is we use a manual edit mode, which the machine gives us an edge. So this is where I feel technology really steps in. Anaga, like your case, 11.3, 11.6 11 and 11.9. I would put this on Cirrus and the Cirrus has a machine called manual edit. So you can zoom in on the picture, manually move on an infrared image on the perfect mid limbal line on one edge and then similarly on the other and then see whether your reading varies. So you get two readings, one which the machine did by itself and one which you did on a manual edit. So over time you realize that the manual edit extremely, whenever there's an issue with the other three readings, the patient is put on the manual edit mode and usually we go in more towards the manual edit, the reading is just nearer to the manual edit. So by now, by default, most of our calculations are based on our serious outcomes and we're getting fantastic results. So now the problem is that just too many machines. So if we have the, U, the UBM, the Pentacam, the IOL master now, it's difficult okay. to have both Pentacam. I'll answer Pentacam. that question also, Anaga. Anybody in fact, who can give... Uh, the more confused you can get. Excellent. So, I'll simplify it. If you have a decent autorefractor keratometer, which gives you a very good infrared image and it has a built-in pupillometer, this will work, believe me. In my secondary or smaller centers where I have not kept these Cirrus or these Pentacams, this is how we work for the basic screening. So we've also tabulated the calculations on an autorefractor keratometer, measuring the mid limbal line, white to white, and the readings are sent to us and the patient comes to the secondary center. We find that mostly these corroborate with that. So in case a person does not have access to a high-end machine and he just wants to have an idea. So this comes in handy. Suppose you do a white to white on your Pentacam, on your caliper and some other machine, and you have varying readings. So just an auto-refractor keratometer with a pupillometer built in, provided it gives you a very clear infrared image, is going to settle the decision between these extreme readings. It's very helpful. Shreyas, you wanted to add something? 
no no i mean that's the uh, basis of the study that we did and uh, even from experience from a lot of cases uh, unlike what dr uh, anaga said in uh, uh, in mo mo most i think uh, multi surgeon practices larger uh, volume practices uh, it's very very rare that the operating surgeon actually measures the white to white it's usually being measured yeah. by a, a trained or a skilled optometrist so there are variations no doubt there are variations and that is why we want to look at alternatives from just the digital caliper measurement alone um, to oversimplify the statement digital caliper if you have to have a alternate first measurement it would be preferably a shimflug device followed by an optical biometer optical biometer while reliable like well, like i showed in my all my slides the mean values of different studies will be similar but it does throw out outliers and those yeah. outliers is where you may get caught there are fewer outliers with the shine flug than compared to the optical biometers uh, and you would probably want to choose more, more in favor of the shine flug and of course if you want to be a little more fancy linear regression analysis well now I think, you know, the basic uh, the basic difference between a shine flug device and an optical biometer is the optical biometer measures sulcus to sulcus while yeah. so, what we want with our uh, actual measurement what we want is mid limbus to mid limbus so basically practically of course shesh has done a detailed study but practically what we do is uh, use either a topolizer or a pentacam or a cirrus device depending on the center where what is available make digital calipers the basic instrument and get the measurement and compare the two if they uh, these two tally together then go with the measurement obviously we have tried ubm but as was pointed out is very often very difficult to even identify exactly which is the sulcus because that's the kind yeah. of uh, uh, what uh, uh, clarity that you get with these instruments so if you give two different observers or the same observer to take a measurement you will get two different measurements so we have practically given up, given up uh, using ubm for this though because the lens uh, rests in the sulcus you would think that's the right way to go in our hands practically what uh, seems to work is a good one year calipers machine with digital calipers measurement taken under the operating microscope compared with a shine flug device and if these two things tally most often it works out well good so uh, we can i have a quick yes, one just one point, point i wanted to make here yes yes rajesh yeah so i completely agree with what dr ramurthy has said that ultimately see if you go and measure sulcus to sulcus sulcus then your size of the lens should be exactly the diameter of what you have measured Absolutely. whereas if you look at the nomogram the nomogram varies with the white to white and the anterior chamber depth that means the deeper you are the lens size becomes bigger so it takes into consideration so for me if i had the situation where what anaga has posed i would rely definitely on my caliper measurement i would go back and i would measure it again especially if a patient is a contact lens wearer sometimes they can have ill defined limbus so you have to first go in you know re uh, you know remeasure taking into account what defines the mid limbus and then compare it with one of the shine flux and usually if i do i have found on my series there is a value that comes in it's called hpid a uh, horizontal visible yeah. iris diameter and somehow that seems to correlate very well with the caliper measurement that we do and i take into account that in such a case when you have 11.3 is better to use that because the size of the icl that would be given will prevent excessive vaulting whereas if you try to go with the higher measurement you will end up with a vault more than 800 900 and a shallow entry chamber Yes, makes sense. I was just going to make that same point, sir. It's actually yeah. white to white or HVID, which is what is measured across uh, devices, and uh, HVID tends to be slightly more than the white to white uh, for measurement. Sure. So has then, do you have a multiplication factor which can be used for the optimizing the different instruments? I'm no. asking you, Rish. I mean, based no. on. No, oh, that, sorry, that's, can... that's, that, that's what they, it's not a multiplication factor alone. I mean, it's a, a regression equation. It has a constant and a variable uh, component. Uh, so applying that regression equation from the large data set that we took uh, of about uh, six, 700 measurements, we arrived at a linear regression analysis, which increased, enhanced the accuracy, enhanced the uh, agreement value, enhanced the R square. So while we had only 66% agreement of within a variation of 0.2 millimeter, 
between Pentacam and Digital Caliper. Uh, using the linear regression analysis, it was we were able to improve it from 66 to 98 percent. So mm -hmm. it just increased, uh, reduced the outliers, uh, improved the uh, agreement between the various measurements. Now we go on to a little uh, little variation in this. Has the sizing of fake IOL changed with a central hole? Like if a patient has a thousand micron volt or a hundred micron volt, when would you decide on an exchange? Would you exchange it if the patient is still comfortable? Mm -hmm. I want. Uh, shall I? Whom do I ask? Uh, shall I ask Dr. Purendra Basin? Dr. Purendra Basin, are you there? Okay. Please unmute. Yes, unmute. Yes, no, no, Dr. Basin sir is muted. So please unmute. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can you repeat the question, please? Now, if the patient, no, since the, uh, we have a central hole in our phagic IOLs, if a patient has a thousand micron volt or a hundred micron volt, when would you decide it's time to change, exchange these lenses? And if the patient is... <coughs> Yeah. So one is uh, when the patient, the vault is very high and there is a rise in intraocular pressure, there is occlusion of the angle of the anterior chamber when we see it like this. And uh, then we have to plan for explantation of the, of the IUL. And if it is more than 900 or 1000, then we ask the patient to come for follow-up periodically. And if we find that there is a the patient is uh, there is a rise in intraocular pressure and angle occlusion is there, then we will definitely explant it. Otherwise, we can um, if it is around 900 or 800 or 700, then we can leave it and we can ask the patient to come for follow up every three months. Yes, doing a serial gonioscopy makes uh, sense. Parker, you and, yeah, uh, so uh, that was the first part of the question. I totally agree with what Parindra said. And um, it is the angle that has to be measured time and again, time and again, and a close follow-up. So to uh, um, assure ourselves that the angle is not occluded, provided, of course, the IOP is not rising. If the IOP is rising, then it is a case where you have to explant it. Uh, the and other... Sir, may I put in a comment here? I would also say some pigment. Oh, if you see pigment on the lens. Yeah. The other part of the uh, question was 100 microns of vault. Now, these cases, again, have to be watched for the cataractus change to take place. And uh, with these ICLs, uh, I've been following up uh, maybe uh, a couple of ICLs over quite some time, about 100, 125 microns of vault. They have not yet developed cataract. This is nearly two years, three years now. And it is, there, there should be, a, uh, I mean, not a hurry to expand these lenses if it is carrying on. If the patient does not develop cataractus changes, if the patient vision is fine, these uh, patients can be carried on with close follow-up. Yes. Yes. Can doctor. I add one thing? Uh, can I add something? Yeah. Can I? Yes, doctor. Uh, tell me. Yeah, but in hundred micron vault, what I do is I dilate people fully and do pentacam and Schimpflug imaging and see the uh, the the uh, the vault which is equal because sometimes what I have seen is with uh, the low vault there is a peripheral sagging of the eye lens. So it touches in the peri peri mid periphery, the lens touches the lens, the crystalline lens in mid periphery. If it is not touching, if the vault is uh, further reduced in the mid periphery, then I will explant it and we will see for the development of cataract. If it, there is anterior subcapsule, anterior capsular cataract is there, then we explant it. And with the centra flow, newer lenses, uh, the chances of development of cataract even at low vault of 100 or 125 or 150 is uh, very rare. But peripheral sagging of the lens, uh, I always see after dilatation of the people of the uh, of the ICL or IPCL. Dr. Sanjay, yeah. So first, the issue of a flat vault. That means a very low vault. We have to know that ICL has a natural vault of about 85 microns, which means even if it is totally flat on the crystalline lens, it will still have a vault of 85 microns. 
Now the question is that if it is that flat, then we explant it or not explant it. Our experience and knowledge of whatever is discussed on platform is that as long as the aqueous is flowing, there is no aqueous stasis, we wait and watch. And we have watched these cases for the last six, seven years, and they have not developed any cataract. And this is what the literature is saying now all over the place, that with the central hold, the chances of cataracts are minimal. It does not mean that somebody somewhere will not land up in a cataract. But in the meantime, it is better to wait and watch because the likelihood of developing cataract is getting very remote now. Now, in the situation of a very high vault, 1000 volt is actually still not a very high vault. It is high, Absolutely. but still not a very high vault. 1300, 1400 is getting higher. Now, if you have a high vault, then you have to see what is the IOP. Keep a close watch on it. And if it is really very shallow, it, it, the looks really doesn't look nice. That is all over. And sometimes you even find that the iris touches the endothelium at one point. Or, or the rub of the lens on the pigment epithelium of the iris is so strong that you start getting ectropion of the uveal tissue. It is always better to explant these lenses because once in a while it is going to give you trouble. So a good vault, but a good, uh, fairly acceptable depth of the interior chamber over the ICL, leave it as such. Nasty looking, uh, take it out. Dr. Kamal, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I, I think I would tend to agree with all the previous people, but also have my own take on it. Shallow vault, if it's a toric lens, I would explant it. Because sooner or later, it will rotate. Take it from me, sooner or later, it will rotate. And number one, my second condition would be, if I have a patient who I cannot keep on regular follow-up, believe me, there could be patients like that, I would explant shallow vault. So toric IOLs and a patient who cannot be in a regular follow-up for a shallow vault, I would explant, number one. Even with the IPCL as its ICL, the, the inherent vault is 350, but still at 350, there could be chances if the lens rise is higher. I'm talking about the lens rise. So what we do is before we do the fakey coil, we calculate the lens rise. So then this lens could be touching at the periphery and the contact point, even if there is a centra flow, the contact point with the mechanical iteration can cause a cataract. So I agree with what Dr. Purinder said, dilate the patient, do a sham flood imaging, see whether the periphery is touching or not. So if it's a toric lens, periphery is not touching. If it's non-toric, periphery is not touching. I have a patient on follow-up, I would not explain. If it is a toric lens, I cannot have the patient on follow-up. And on dilatation, I see a possibility of touch and an pigment on the IOL. I would explain. That is my experience. Very huge number of lenses. At that, I would say that. Now, in this case, it's a high volt. I agree with Dr. Sanjay. I have patients who are 1200, 1300, 1400. I'm following them up, they are great. So what I look for is a plateau of iris coming up. Number two, if the pupil is accidentally dilated on Tropica cell plus and the iris is getting stuck, getting back to place, I would explain, I do an gonioscopy and again, I look for pigments. If these things are there, I would explain, but if they're all fine, I would not explain even at 13. So does it make it important for all of us to think that we should also measure the lens rise and it has an impact on the sizing of the fakic IOL? Uh, Shresh, would you when want you, to add? When you, I yes. think especially when you have a lower wall, that's when the lens rise really comes in fast. That's yes. very important. Yes. Shresh, because the, some of these were on <coughs> sizing of IOL, do you have anything to add? Because there have been wonderful discussions no. now. L lens rise is definitely important. Uh, the the only unfortunate thing is uh, we don't know at what value of lens rise that we need to change the uh, size of lens that we choose. That cutoff is not clearly established. So at least it's still not followed in any of the nomograms. We have lens rise measurements. And as Dr. Kamal uh, pointed out, the obvious that in a shallow vault, uh, your lens rise becomes even more important. That's definitely taken.
Ma'am, yes. Swapna here. If I may just put in a comment, my video is not working again, like Anakha. <laughs> so, um, uh, actually, I had tried to do a study on that, and we tried to see if the lens size is significant as far as sizing of the eye hole is concerned, because uh, just to prevent, you know, a low vault uh, or a high vault. And we went to star with it, and I had talked to one of their uh, clinical applications uh, people when we had gone for one of their. Uh, um, you know, conferences abroad. And she said that they, they had already done a study and they found that lens size is not a significant. I don't have details of the study, but STAR has for its ICL already conducted uh, research on the factor that lens size may be an important factor. And they have found that it doesn't it, it affect the sizing of the IO. That is why they have not revised their nomogram and then continue to use the same one. Now we are going to stop the discussion here because I, we need to learn a lot more from other speakers. And our next speaker, and uh, Swapna, your uh, message was valuable. Our next speaker is Dr. Swapna Nair, a senior consultant, cataract and refractive services at the Chaitanya Group of Hospitals, a very prominent cataract and refractive surgeon of our country. And she is going to talk on something very important for all of us, material and design behind fake IOs. And on to you, Swapna. Nice seeing you. Uh, yeah, ma'am. So that is a recording I made of the presentation. Uh, so uh, uh, because, I mean, I my camera was giving me a lot of trouble. So uh, I'd, I'd like to play the recording because I'm not sure that uh, I'll be able to, uh, you know, keep the camera on or, uh, you know, I may, I may just fudge it yeah, up. Go ahead. Go ahead. You be with us for the discussions. Yeah. Can you open your presentation? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Talking about star vision, I see it. Uh, am I so we know that, that the basic yeah. requirement of taking intraocular lens is that it should be biocompatible to stay inside the eye, should be able to pass through a very small incision, uh, sub three millimeters. It should be soft and pliable for non-traumatic maneuvering, both into the posterior chamber and out of it if required. It should be very thin so that when it occupies the posterior chamber, it causes no deformation of the iris or uh, no trauma to the lens beneath it. It should incorporate a wide refractive range, especially because a lot of patients that come in for a, a, a implantation of a fake IOL are patients that are unable to do a laser refractive correction of the cornea, and they may have a higher range of power than is proposed for LASIK. And of course, it should be non-brittle easily deformable so that can be easily extracted. The lens is made of a combination of hydroxyethyl methacrylate, which is 99% of the material and 1% collagen. Now this combination makes sure that it is quiet inside the eye. At the same time, it has a very good transmittance of light and a low reflectance pattern. It's very flexible so that whatever we wanted earlier, like passing through a small incision or the ease of injectability into the anterior chamber or of removal uh, becomes very smooth. And of course, it's easy to incorporate all the uh, range of refractive uh, powers that we want into the lens by lathing. So we are talking about a combination, a polymer of uh, human collagen like material and Poussin collagen-like material and uh, a hydrophilic acrylic material. Now, this extreme pliability makes sure that whenever the lens is uh, passing through very narrow tubes uh, that it requires for loading or when it's being pushed out for injection through a small incision, it remains uh, unbroken and can easily get back to its normal shape the shape that's supposed to sit inside the um, eye, uh, even though it gets deformed heavily inside the tube. And even for explantation, when it's brought from the posterior chamber into the anterior chamber, you can see that it does not damage any of the tissues involved and by itself also does not da get damaged when being pulled out through the same incision that it was passed into, unlike an intraocular lens, which sometimes needs to be cut before being removed. Uh, now, why is it quite in the posterior chamber? It's basically because of 
the property of this material that we talked about, the colama, which minimizes inflammation, flare, and any sort of cellular reaction inside the anterior chamber. And so it's ideal even for patients who are prone to inflammation like diabetics or those that have chronic uveitis, uh, though we only uh, insert the lens when the eye is quiet. There is a formation of a uh, monolayer of fibromectin around the lens, which prevents any sort of reaction with the uh, 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 all the uh, materials in the aqueous humor. So because of that reason, even uh, in this eye, which is a post-trauma uh, cataract extracted uh, with an IOL placed inside eye, you can uh, see the amount of inflammation uh, that's there and all the posterior sinicae that are there. Even in such an eye, when there is a large refractive error, you can easily put this lens as a piggyback lens. And this allows for the correction of the lens it's, uh, of the refractive error. It also makes sure that it does not uh, cause this inflammation prone iris to get more inflamed. It does not deform the iris further. So uh, this because lens can sit on top of the uh, intraocular lens and prevent any sort of biofilm formation between the two uh, interfaces. So all this ensures uh, an extra indication for that lens. So we know the positioning of the lens is uh, behind the iris. Unlike a lot of uh, initial fake intraocular lenses that were either self uh, yeah, placed the in the anterior chamber or uh, clipped to the iris. This ensures that far from the endothelium, there's excellent cosmetics it's invisible to the uh, uh, naked eye. And it's definitely close to the nodal points of the eyes, so, uh, 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 increasing the, the retinal image level? size. Yeah, it's and so we can hear you now. We can hear you. Now. Can hear you. Right. Plane, but that varies okay. depending on the dietary power of no, the No, I want to know whether the Because it's placed in the sulcus, it's a stable not you take one from here. can have a toric design on the same, same platform. So, uh, it does not... Uh, it is it's not prone to rotation. It's easy to remove and exchange because, because uh, it's not too it deep within the eye and there's no uh, fixation uh, to iris because tissue because of the white nature of the lens. It does not alter shape. Uh, there is no uh, removal of tissue from the cornea, unlike in laser vision correction. Uh, now, it has a plate haptic design with four foot plates. And a forward board, which is incorporated into the design of the lens. There is also provision for aqueous drainage so that you don't need to make any more peripheral eye dotomies. There's a hole in the middle of the optic for improved aqueous humor flow. So what are the now, the basic hard core specs uh, of this lens that the are the optic diameter of, of a variable depending range, on depending on whether you're using it correct, myopic correction or heteropic correction. All the way from mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. varies mm -hmm. depending on so the power that needs to be corrected. The power correctable range also varies all the way from minus 0.25 to minus 18 for myopia, a lesser range up to 10 diopters for hypermetropia, and a range of around 6 diopters for acid. Astigmatism. Astigmatism. Again, the sizing of the, the lens of also the lens has a good variance again from 11.6 to 13.7 millimeters, so depending on what type of error is being corrected. Seven. So you can see so all these in this, um, uh, this diagram. Now, the natural wall thing of here, the lens that, that is incorporated uh, the, uh, in uh, this lens makes sure that it stays away from the anterior lens capsule without deforming the eyes too much. So that the natural this this lack of contact with the anterior lens capsule, capsule ensures that that there is uh, no uh, it's not prone to get right formation. And in such a situation, so the ideal lens that, that we're looking for is, is somewhere uh, between two hundred to eight hundred microns. You can have high or low walls, and, is and but that depends on the lens cycle and not on this natural vault of the lens. So if you have an inappropriately high sized lens, then you will have a very high volt, course, making the patient uh, prone to a narrow angle and glaucoma. And if uh, it is very right. low, then and you can have cataract. A low the lens is also like very unstable lens, uh, prone to rotation, which is not an ideal situation for a toric intraocular lens. So you can here see how a low voltage lens is lying loosely in the posterior chamber and can easily move by the cannula without actually taking it out of the sulcus and repositioning it. So what we looked up before, the, the biocompatibility,
compatibility uh, and the ability to pass through very small incisions, the pliability of the lens, the softness of the lens, so that can be maneuvered multiple times into various positions, uh, and the thinness of the lens, which is thin enough to occupy the posterior chamber. At the same time, it incorporates a wide uh, amount of refractive power, a wide range of refractive power. So all these factors combine and form an ideal uh, phakic intraocular lens, both in terms of material as well as design. Stays for a long time. Thank you very much. Form of reaction. Thank you very much. Thanks, Swapna. That's a, uh, that was a good talk. It was nice hearing you also. Now, I have a question. Of course, I'll ask uh, Ramurti, but all of you can put in your thoughts. We'll keep a watch on the time, of course. Do you see any advantage of having a polymer over the present day hydrophilic lenses, which are doing well in the market? Anyway, we also need to know that a polymer component is only, uh, polygen component is only 0.2%. So, what are your thoughts against? Uh, sticking on to ICL or, or looking at the other uh, market scenario. Dr. Ramurti, are you there? It's not there. Uh, Dr. Uh, Partha? Dr. Yes. Puren, yes, Partha? Yes, yeah. Okay. So uh, actually, uh, I use 90% uh, of the ICL only and uh, because it has been a very, very time tested uh, for me and for everybody else. So I have been sticking on to ICL for 90% of my cases. Only 10% I do IPCL. And uh, Dr. Yes, Kamal? Uh, I think excellent presentation. My only query would be, I even with my ICL or IPCLs, I refrain from chronic uveitis. I have seen patients with chronic uveitis who are well settled and uh, I've seen them have hiccups. They do have intense flare-ups at times. And the other eye where I've not done the surgery, let's say there was a patient with anisometropic and both eyes were chronic uveitis. They're well settled. I operate one eye and suddenly this eye starts showing up some signs of inflammation. I need to keep them on NSAIDs. So my tick box for chronic uveitis is not ticked either with ICL or IPCL. Maybe... Uh, this is one area in fake tiles where you may call me a bit reserved. I'm very aggressive with my fake clearances, but in my, my bucket, I do not touch chronic VX. I've burned my hand with cortis. So if anybody is for the a hydrophilic material, you can raise your different... I think yes, results, I are there for, uh, results and outcome. Uh, actually, I started uh, doing Indian hydrophilic acrylic lenses from care group and I slowly entered into it and uh, I followed them now for last I think three four years I have followed them and more than that and I find that uh, results with uh, are comparable with the Colamar ICL lenses absolutely I so agree with there is uh, no 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 much difference because the question is very specific so I will answer Yes. There is a difference between the two and the outcome is almost the same and indications and all we are the same. Okay. Now, Ketra, I would say that the, this material is as good. As good. And I think I, I would vouch for it. I've done nearly 3,000 of these uh, Indian lenses. Track record of follow-up for more than seven years now. I've done very, very decent numbers of ICLs. I've also done other Indian brands. So I don't think there's much difference. And you're right, you're just a decimal point of a polymer. I don't know in real world how much difference it's making, but at least in the clinical practice, I agree with Dr. Purinder, I don't see much difference. Now, what about using uh, these lenses which have the zero 180 degree advantage? Uh, now, we do know that we measure the horizontal white to white and we know that the vertical white to white is less. So... Now, keeping that in mind, now these uh, care group lenses come with a 0, 180 degree advantage and the ICL come with the different axis measurements. So what is your take on this? Um, yes, Dr. Kamal? Uh, I think this has a huge advantage even for a beginner surgeon and even for an you know, accomplished surgeon, it has a huge advantage. It takes the load off. 
because let's understand even a five degree under vault is going to give me 15 degrees of under correction. And when you're correcting minus eight diopters of cylinder, seven diopter cylinder, 10, 14 diopters of astigmatism in repaired corneas, that, 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 that faith of landing on 0, 180 time and time and again, and not depending on rotation and secondary markings and all that, at least in my setup, I, I am a lot more reassured and the results are phenomenal. So I think I am more comfortable in, in this segment with the care group lens when especially I'm dealing with very high astigmatism because of a very, very high predictability. Dr. Rajesh, would you have something to add on this? Or your experiences with ICL only? Yeah, my experience is with ICL. I, I don't do uh, the kind of volumes what others do, and I definitely don't have that experience. But whatever I have done over the last 15 years with ICL, I've had very good outcomes without any complications. Dr. Sanjay, I would you like to have, uh, make a comment here, ma'am, if I can? Yes. Uh, yes. There, there was a study in the IJO in 2019 that mm -hmm. said that for every three uh, ICL, the, every one ICL that develops a cataract, three IPCLs do. So um, uh, it, it was there. So uh, I, I don't know how much it's true because even my experience is only with ICLs. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I had just come across it. So does it have anything to do with the material or anyone with experience if they would comment on it? No, I wouldn't agree at all. If the parameters are followed, the sizing absolutely. is done appropriately, there is absolutely we have not had a single situation. These are, uh, the, the, the issue is about the measurement. The, uh, which is a yes. challenge, and if that I, is done appropriately, all materials are I, really I good. I completely agree that yes. some of the IPCL with cataract that I have, I have managed in my practice have been purely the undersized ones. Absolutely. So it's rotating, and the primary surgeon has not gone back and exchanged the lens, and because of the undervolting and the movement, the patient has developed cataract, and then we have to remove that and do the cataract surgery. But if you recognize, see, the problem is the advantage of ICL is that you have 0.5 steps. So even that little bit of variation of white to white measurement, that over that 0.5 step kind of takes care of that, whether you get a little bit of excessive vaulting, but with the IPCL being in 0.25 steps, you have to be extra careful about the white to white measurement because it is not as forgiving as the ICL. So you will have sizing issues more with the IPCL than with the ICL. Anaga, you have a question? I have one. But if you have, you can take yours. Anaga, are you there? Okay, this is something very basic, I think, which will be of you. Yes, Anaga. You have a question to ask or shall I take mine? No, no, you can go ahead, ma'am. You can go ahead. No. There was some connectivity issue. That's why there was a problem. No, yeah. I just wanted to ask you all to clarify. I'm sure we all know the answer. Why is it that all fakie kayols are plate haptic lenses? which are kept in the sulcus as against the sulcoflex lenses which are uh, have an optic and a looped haptic design what could be the reason have you all can you all any of you uh, uh, like sulcoflex is meant to be put in a pseudo fakie guy yes the design is such so it doesn't take into account the anterior curvature of the lens yes whereas the icl is designed to take care of the anterior curvature of the lens so it has to have in plate haptic, so it can sit in the sulcus and the rest of the lens rises over the, uh, yeah. the crystalline lens. Yes. Now, uh, it so happens Dr. Sonu Goel is not there because, because he, some of his colleagues in his office had uh, dengue and he had to take care of the surgical list. Now, his topic was a 40-year-old high hypero. Would it be a fakic IOL or a prelex? So, in related to that, I'm going to take, we all know that we have discussed about a 40-year-old, about a high hypero. Uh, my question was, when you talk of a presbyopic fakic IOL for a 40-year-old hypero, I'm sure uh, for a hypero at 40, we would not be thinking of the regular fakic IOL. Is there a difference in visual quality uh, for these lenses as against uh, going in for a presbyopia correcting IOL? Is my thought... Uh, I want my expert panel to open on it. Or uh, Dr. Titial is there? Yes, yes, I'm there. Yeah. Yes, a 40-year-old hyperos. No, so, uh, Chitra, you are absolutely right. The question, uh, uh, person, uh, when you compare the fakic IOLs on a, this age group 
to a clear lens extraction because uh, hyperopes, especially high hyperopes, will have a lot of uh, aberrations uh, in the lens at this age. If given an option, if I have to do a clear lens extraction, the quality of vision will be far better than a, you know, a fake IL in these group of patients. And uh, whatever experience I have with the fake IL in the press biopsy age group, I think I have only had one patient of high probes uh, who are fulfilling the anatomical criteria for uh, implanting. Most of these patients don't fit into a, a fake IL range. And most of them will get into a you know, clear lens extraction with uh, good quality IOLs and uh, quality of vision is far better in uh, that group of patients. Uh, then in that uh, uh, relation to that, of course, we are transgressing from fake IOL, but doing justice to Sonu Goel's talk, which was not there, the discussion point is, in a high hyperope, would you, uh, would you think it's more sensible to put the single high part uh, lens in the bag or would you like to put a significant in the bag and look at the remainder afterwards and add a piggyback lens? Uh, I think this, this point also has been discussed many, many times. If your IOL power goes beyond 34 or 36 diopters, suppose we have a patient requires a 44 or a 50 diopter lens, especially in a nanophthalmic eye, no point putting a that thicker lens to that patient because the optics uh, and the aberration induced by that intraocular lens will be uh, too much. So I might go for a routine uh, good quality lens of 34 or 36 diopter. I think we get up to 38 diopters. Put that lens and we have an option of uh, putting a secondary implantation like sulcoflex in these cases. And you'll have a space also and I'll go with a second implantation these patients subsequently. Few patients I've done a single uh, uh, stage surgery with uh, plus 55 diopter lens also. But the quality of vision was so poor in these patients, they were never happy. And I'm listening to uh, Ramamurti many, many times regarding this issue. And now I have uh, two patients where I've done a you know, two stage implantation and the quality is far better there. Absolutely. Dr. Purendra Vaseen, your thought on that? I think um, uh, I agree with Dr. TTL. And uh, for one more reason, because the IOL power calculation is unreliable in all these cases. Yes. With, the, with the smaller axial lens, the IOL power calculation is not the same because everything, the whole anatomy in hyperopes changes, anterior chamber depth and everything. And uh, with the piggyback lenses or two-stage lenses, and these patients are moreover amblyopic also. So many a times I have seen if you do under correction, they are very happy with that because they achieve 618 or such kind of a vision with that power also. And uh, maybe they require some near add, more near add, maybe three or three and a half diopters. So that is the reason. And if they are unsatisfied, dissatisfied, the, and that gap is more, then we can plan for a, a second stage surgery with a piggyback lens or maybe with the IPCL, ICL, or the Sulcoplex. Sulcoplex lenses are not available as of now. So Care Group has also come out with the new lens, uh, which can be uh, implanted in uh, in the Sulcus, and it is uh, with this Yugdufikic lens that is there. Uh, yes, come on. I think I couldn't agree more with the Purender and uh, the previous speaker. Because uh, Dr. Tityal also said, you know, the moment the, the diaphragmic power of the lens keeps going up, it, the optical quality goes down. There's so much of spherical abrasion which creeps in. So also the accuracy of the formulas, and let's not forget, smaller the eye, less forgiving the error. The biometric error is very, very unforgiving in a small eye. In a myope, little bit of things here and there, it's more forgiving. As the axial lens starts getting smaller, the formula accuracy gets more tighter and it gets more unforgiving. So it's a good idea to put in a primary lens, wait for some time, and as Purendra said, wait for the patient satisfaction. And in case the patient is not satisfied, there are ample of nomograms available all around just for free downloads. You put in your refractive error, you put in your AC depth, you put in your keratometry, and bang on, you get the power of the secondary lens. I do it so very often, and the patients are far more happier, as Dr. Titial said, than if you would do a high optic lens on the first one. I agree with both of them. 
yeah quality of vision is an issue but with the present day formulas with a better elp estimation we are not that off the mark as we were earlier on uh, and one very important thing before we go on to rajesh's talk is that when i earlier talked about this 2.7 diopter ac depth and phakic ir we all have to be cognizant of the fact that there is some amount of ac shallowing occurring in every surgery like post operatively the ac value is lesser after a phakic ir implant and gonioscopically also the angle which is 25 becomes 3 to 4 diopter 3 to 4 degrees less so this has to be factored in in our minds when we are looking at uh, moving on from the golden line of 2.8 diopters to less that there is going to be more ac shallowing it's not going to sit at 2.7 so the next speaker is dr rajesh fogla a senior uh, a senior consultant and director of the cornea clinic at apollo hospitals hyderabad a very leading figure in cornea and anterior segment with a great international presence a great surgeon and he is going to talk on phakic ials in keratoconus on to you dr rajesh we look forward to learning a lot from you my slides are visible yeah yeah at the outset i would like to thank <coughs> dr chitra and the arc aios for inviting me to be part of this exciting symposium and it's nice to learn quite a bit from the masters in uh, in phakic ios so the topic given is toric icl in keratoconus i don't have any financial interest in this presentation and the first question that we ask is is there a role for phakic iol in keratoconus we heard naren uh, talking about the contraindications and one of the last slides he showed was a patient with keratoconus and where he said that uh, you know maybe this raises a red flag and you should not consider a phakic iol and in fact if you look at the indications from uh, star icl even they don't recommend uh, in the indication Uh, for any patient with keratoconus so it's actually a off label use now looking at a patient with keratoconus we know that a patient of keratoconus has lot of induced high order aberrations typically the coma and this results in visual degradation and that can res result in uh, you know dis uh, dissatisfactory vision and in a majority of these cases uh, uh, a satisfactory vision is achieved only by using a rigid ga uh, gas permeable contact lens keratoconus is a disease which can progress over time which means your refractive error and the astigmatism can change in advanced cases you can develop eye drops and patients may require corneal surgery in future so taking all this into account is uh, you know phakic iol an indication but if you look at the published literature you will find that there are numerous articles which talk about successful outcome using uh, phakic intraocular lens implantation either in combination with cross linking uh, sequentially or with uh, you know doing topography guided surface ablation or placing intracorneal ring segments so using a varied combination people have been able to use the phakic iol to try and uh, achieve good vision in patients with keratoconus we already heard uh, you know uh, various speakers to give us details about the phakic iol the two varieties which have been reported in literature are the very size and the uh, the icl the basic indication would be any patient with keratoconus where the best spectacle corrected visual acuity is 612 or better and the patient has to be happy with this 612 vision it shouldn't be like patient has to strain to read that 612 but the patient should be very comfortable the astigmatism should be less than 6 diopters the keratoconus should be stable and non progressive sometimes you need to do a cross linking prior to considering the phakic iol and the other criteria for phakic iol have to be met in terms of the endothelial cell count the anterior chamber depth and so on uh, in in terms of surgery there is a, a no specific step that you would like to see this is a old video of a patient who has already had a intracorneal ring placement and now the patient is undergoing a toric icl implantation so the basic surgical steps are the same where you mark the axis 
uh, fill the chamber with viscoelastic and then you implant the uh, fake cavity. This is a toric ICL being implanted. Uh, this is one of the cases where you will see uh, a patient who has a, a moderate keratoconus. Uh, astigmatism was about 3.4 diopters. He was in, his refractive error was 9.5 with minus two cylinder improving to 6.9 and we implanted a toric ICL and the post implantation AR value if you see is about plus one with some plus 0.25 cylinder and his vision unaided vision improved to 20.30 or 6.9 at a vault of about 600 and good endothelial cell count and maintain that at long term follow. So this is what we have presented back uh, both at AO and ACRS and we analyzed 36 eyes of 24 patients who had undergone toric ICL implantation. The age group, mean age group was 26 years ranging from 17 to 40. 12 of these eye, uh, patients had bilateral procedure. The average follow-up was about 13.7 months. The average pre uh, cross-linking K was 51 diopters post Cross-linking was also the same, no progression, had good specular counts and anterior chamber depth on an average was about 3.9, which, which is expected in patients with keratoconus. The average pachymetry was 461. But what you see is that the unaided vision from 2200 went up to 2040. And the number of lines of improvement, if you see on an average, 44% of the patients had seven lines of improvement in uncorrected visual acuity. Even the best spectacle corrected visual acuity from 2040 average improved to 2025. And that's expect, uh, expected because the ICL is placed closer to the nodal point. And so these are a subset of patients uh, who did very well uh, with the toric ICL. Now com coming to how do we plan? I have shown you that yes, toric ICL can be done. It does work in keratoconus. So do you go ahead and do it in each and every keratoconus patients? No. You, it basically, you have to look at the location of the cone. The cone has to be fairly central. There should not be a significant amount of superior inferior asymmetry. The keratoconus should be stable. If it is, if you are in doubt, then please do a cross-linking first. And then six, six, uh, three to six months later, you can plan for a ICL implantation. Take into consideration the pupil size as well. Uh, in our population, the pupil size is a little small. So that's to our advantage of our patients dark colored iris also helps. But if the mesopic pupil size is large, it's beyond five or five millimeter, then maybe it's not a great idea to implant a toric ICL in patient with keratoconus. Understand the patient's expectation. Explain to the patient that the vision would be the same or slightly better than what they can see with the spectacles, but not as good as what they can achieve with the rigid contact lens. Spending time before you perform the procedure is helpful because it can avoid disappointment uh, post-procedure. Often we need a combination of procedure, like either doing a cross-linking followed by the toric ICL. Sometimes we do a single segment intact ring placement to lift up the sagging cone and make it central, and that helps. Uh, if the corneal thickness is more than 470 microns, we can do a little bit of topography guided surface ablation to try and regularize the surface. And uh, one minute remaining. Yeah, so I'm coming to an end. And a majority of these cases had high myopia as well. So the toric ICL helped in reducing the myopia and their dependency on wearing the contact lens. So this is again some of the topographies you can see. So this is a patient with early keratoconus. This is one eye early, and the other eye you can see it's a fairly central cone. So these are great patients. Uh, if this is a patient who had an inferior cone. We placed an intact after which you can see that the cone has become fairly central and the astigmatism has reduced. So in this case, for managing the myopia, you can consider a toric ICL implantation. So basically in conclusion, a fakic IOL such as toric ICL can be considered in select cases of keratoconus for visual improvement. Please remember it's not a refractive procedure and this needs to be explained to the patient. Uh, it's important to understand the patient's expectations prior to the surgery. Luckily for us, a toric ICL is a reversible procedure. So if a patient is not happy with the outcome, the toric ICL can be explanted and the patient can go back to the refractive error what they had earlier. Thank you. Thank you for a patient hearing. Uh, Rajesh, I'm going to take questions with you because uh, being a, sure. a cornea situation, 
Now, what would be the extra uh, thing you would advise when it comes to sizing of the lens in a KC patient? What would you tell your company guys? So usually I've not had any issues in terms of sizing if I take white to white and I implant an ICL because here the anterior chamber depth is adequate. So even if your lens is slightly oversized, it doesn't uh, affect the outcome. But if you look at the average vaulting that we achieved in our series of patients where we did the toric ICL, we did not achieve any high vault. The maximum on an average, the vault was between 400 to 600 microns. And that couldn't be taken into account that the anterior chamber depth was much more than what the nomogram does for that same amount of white to white diameter in patients with keratoconus. And we did not do it in very advanced keratoconus. So the, uh, the, the keratometry was uh, not very steep. On an average, it was only about 51 diopters. Dr. Ramurthy, would you want to add? Can I ask a question? Sure, unmute, unmute yourself. The question was no, sizing wait. of the lens. Yeah. Can I great presentation, Rajesh. I mean, uh, uh, just a comment is that we have come to grief on a couple of occasions when we have gone by the regular sizing and implanted a lens. When we send the company uh, to the company, only the central anterior chamber depth. Because as was uh, discussed earlier also, the you could have a central cone and you get an extraordinary measurement over there. But in the periphery, the cornea sure. tends to flatten out. And uh, nowadays, what we have started doing is earlier um, implantation in a case of keratoconus is off label as far as uh, toric ICLs was concerned. So, our experience was more with toric IPCL. Now, with ICL, also it's possible. So, we specifically mentioned to the company it's a case of keratoconus. Often, they also realize looking at the K readings. And normally, we undersize by about 0.25 to 0.5 millimeters. And we find that it works reasonably well in these cases. And uh, you summed it all up, but just to say, you have to look at the uh, centered stable cones. And uh, often I'm asked, how do you know it's a centered cone? You look at the posterior flow. The nipple of the cone or most than half the cone should be within the central three millimeters. And when do you go ahead and implant a toric uh, uh, fakica intraocular lens in a case of a keratoconus, if the patient is happy with the best spectacle corrected visual equity. The patient is dependent on contact lenses Please, please do not implant a fake intraocular lens because there is quite a bit of hyaluronic abrasions which the fake intraocular lens will not uh, take care of. There have been two occasions where we had to expand the lens because the patient did not accept it. What will happen is whatever power you put in the lens, that amount of correction you would have to put in the spectacles after putting a contact lens. Yes. So it's not as if you can rehabilitate the patient after putting a fake intraocular lens by putting a the same kind of rose scale lens or a sterile lens on the cornea. It will not work. So please be very sure that the patient is happy with the best spectacle corrected visual equity before considering a, uh, a toric uh, picky carrier. But if a patient has a mildly decentered cone and a spectacle corrected vision is good, uh, would you... Uh, what yes. would you do? We have done a study on that also. We earlier used to stick... Wanting to with... ask Rajesh uh, his thoughts on that. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Yes. So, oh, in, in the sense that uh, it, it's it's not exact, it's not an exact science, you know. Sometimes we see patients where you look at the topography and you find that despite with that kind of topography, some of these patients with spectacles tend to see quite well. And in fact, quite a few uh, on a, quite a few occasions, I have personally put in the value to check if the patient is actually reading that much instead of believing what my optometrist has written, you know, because sometimes they may, uh, the patient may, may miss out some line. So uh, if, if the patient's spectacle corrected visual acuity is definitely 612 or better, 69 he can read, then I don't worry about that little bit of, in, a little bit of decentered cone. So because that has to do with something to do with the pupil not exactly being in the center, the angle kappa, or so we go ahead and do the ICL. But all the patients that we do the ICL, we always explain to them that this is not, this is an off-label procedure. We do it. If you are not satisfied, there is an option that the ICL can be explanted. But if so the subject, yes, no, Naga, you asked. Yes, 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 no, I just wanted to ask, sir, uh, lovely presentation as always, so clear. So I just wanted to ask, which K reading do you take for these patients? The, the the readings that we get on the topography. So from the topography. Okay. Correct. Now, if the subjective acceptance, uh, does, uh, 
the subjective acceptance and the cylinder which is showing on the topography are in variance, what would you take? No, usually we go by the subjective refraction only. We don't look at the K reading. But, uh, but like I said that before we go ahead, it's important that the surgeon should always try and verify, you know, although you may have excellent, at least uh, for me, I, my optometrist does it, but I have this finicky thing about me going and just checking the axis once again. And I find that that really helps, uh, you know, when you are doing the surgery in terms of the outcome. Yes, Dr. Ramurthy, I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, oh, I quite agree with what was being said. Initially, we used to strictly go by the fact that the cone has to be centered before going ahead and implanting these toric uh, faking intraoc lenses. But uh, obviously, in gross decentration, they won't improve with glasses. But minimal decentration, if the patient is happy with the... So basically, what we go with the best spectacle character visual activity. If the patient is happy with glasses, go ahead and implant a faking intraoc lens, toric lens. And thanks, uh, Rajesh. That was a wonderful talk. And you, the punishment is you stay till the end. <laughs> in fact, uh, in fact, when I did my first toric ICL for a keratoconus patient, having treated keratoconus patient for so long, I was so apprehensive because somehow the science didn't. I, I couldn't believe that you have a deformed cornea, and where you have abnormality in the optics, how is the ICL going to improve the vision? But then looking at the outcome, it was quite gratifying, and the patient. The patients with keratoconus are not as finicky as your refractive patients because they are Absolutely. used to seeing so much of distortion. For them to be able to see 612 also unaided, they are far happy than somebody, you know, looking at, you know, 0 0.25, 0 0.5 residual power and not being able to see very well. Rajesh, <coughs> we go on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is our eminent Dr. Jeevan Tithyal, who heads the RP Center of Ophthalmic Science, a leader amongst leaders in ophthalmology. And he's the best person to tell us on presbyopic fake IOLs. On to you, doctor. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chitra. Uh, indeed, it's my uh, evening, which I've learned so much from I know all the experts on the fake IOL. And many discussion we have uh, completed. I think my job is quite simple. I hope I can incite some discussion subsequently on this talk also. We all know uh, we have a large group of patients who are going to be pressed biopic. In fact, uh, the future generation will be doing surgery for these patients only. And they all require some sort of a spectacle uh, corrections. And difficult part of uh, us would be those patients who are actually dependent of uh, very, very high power, like high myopia, hypermetropia. Those are a patient who already have uh, some sort of a desire to get corrected. And on that, we have an emetropic people who get uh, press biopic subsequently. Options, we do have huge number of options, so which may be cornea-based procedures, which we all have talked to, uh, about sub in the previous presentations uh, on ARC uh, platform. Now we are looking at a lens-based procedure, which we thought about uh, looking for fakey guy as an option, or doing a, some sort of uh, a refractive lens exchange. I'm going to cover the fake IOL part today. And we do have uh, two lenses available uh, in a clinical practice. Uh, in India, we have IPCL press biopic uh, from Gear Group, which is a hydro hybrid hydrophilic acrylic uh, refractive de diffractive design. And we also have Star Evo Viva lens, which is basically uh, aspheric optics, EDOF uh, design. Which, which has the uh, correction up to two diopters in the extended depth of focus may have own advantage of this particular optics. We are awaiting its launch in India so that we can have access to these lenses also. As far as my experience goes, I've used Care Group IPCL uh, press biopic lenses now almost more than three years. And they do give you a large range of dioptic corrections that is from plus 15 to 30 di minus 30 diopters and cylindrical power up to 10 diopters, which we all discussed is the axis customizable, that is 0, 180 degree, and near add uh, ranging from plus 1.5 to 4 diopters. That means it can cover the large range of uh, age group of people uh, who come for uh, this refractive correction with fake IOLs. So sort of uh, the new design is a sort of a trifocal design now, refractive, refractive design. Apart from a giving the uh, advantage of a distance near intermediate correction. These lenses do have their own sets of problem also because of a refractive refractive design. 
but at this age group uh, with advantage of correction the other uh, visual phenomena are normally well tolerated by these lenses very thin lens in the center 80 microns and it also has 380 center uh, flow design which all discussed may decrease the onset of cataract in these patients most importantly the optic uh, diameter is 6.6 mm which can be customized to a larger diameter especially the pupil size larger in some of the patient but what i have seen in the indian population the pupil at this age group is not very large so most patient will fit into uh, these design as such and looking into other way of uh, assessment of these patient we all discuss main important thing will be uh, achieving good bolting and centration i think these are two important thing for a multifocal design which you have to use centration has to be absolutely perfect apart from a good counseling for these patients the surgery is very simple as uh, we would do for all cases and uh, as we discuss people who are well versed with the cataract surgery they can do this surgery also this is 2.8 uh, blade which is being used for these cases it can go through 2.2 easily also the lens cartridge is similar to iol cartridge the little bit of a uh, uh, viscoelastic onto the surface the only problem is the both cartridge and lens is clear so sometimes it's very difficult to pick up the you noise know, orientation but once you orient correctly the leaflet which tells you left and right eye you have to orient differently the basic advantage of these lenses are they uh, open very slowly effectively and it doesn't jerk into the anterior chamber that is very important i use one uh, percent sodium hyaluronate in the anterior chamber uh never used uh, hydro implantation which nowadays people talk about it gives a very simple open you can see how effectively it goes inside the eye without any you know disturbance you can just wait see that uh, the openings should be towards the upper area that the three opening which are there and once you use helon that uh, opening is very slow here so these openings should be towards the upper area that is towards the 12 o'clock area you can see the rings very effectively the lens positioning is also very uh, easy it has a three point uh, fixation you can see this is the inferior area which has been tucked inside similarly both way this can be tucked viscoelastics should be removed after you orient the lens in a proper axis once you remove the viscoelastic subsequent manipulation should not be done so i'll orient this lens to axis of desirable area then remove the viscoelastic effectively in these cases the advantage we all discuss uh, uh, the experts have discussed very very nicely over the refractive lens exchange and over the other ways of correcting i think it is a reversible procedure uh, suitable for a larger degree of refractive error especially uh, larger cylindrical power also and maybe because of phakic situation the vitreous changes or vitreous based disturbance will be less in these cases the chances of for retinal complication will be less but uh, considering their high myope they would have their own sets of problems acd i normally take more than 3 mm considering the older age group of these patients pre op worker we all discussed the only thing i add into is the proper uh, eye trace examination for all patient especially looking for aberration profile internal aberration and dli which is a very important uh, point in uh, these cases as for corrections concern i add 0.5 diopter addition to the reading glasses for these patient for effective correction this is one patient of mine 43 year old male patient with the moderate uh, re refractive error with the good parameters with the ac depth i do kcf for all patient to look at angle area also topographic uh, normal both eyes and dli is also normal very suitable case dli is a important part for all examination of phakic uh, iol for presbyopy age group this is another patient you can see a more internal aberration and dli is also poor So this patient may not be a suitable case of fake eye wear. This is one result published, uh, European result on a IPCL with a good uh, outcome. As far as I am concerned, uh, I had a good experience. I had three patients with cataract formation within the first uh, one year of uh, uh, their uh, implantation, despite a good bolt in these cases. One case I had with a methyl cellulose getting Sir, stuck between the lens remaining. and the uh, yeah lens and the uh, IPCL uh, uh, surface. and never went off at i had to do cataract surgery with that patient pupil size fluctuations there sometimes and this another patient uh, 47 year old moderate myopia good case for a fake eye well entire aberration profile improved subsequent implantation even the mtf improved by these patients 
This is one patient you can see uh, DLI worsens subsequently. So this is a very important indicator in post-op period to assess these patients apart from their visual acuity, examination and slit lamp. If you have access to eye trace, that can give you a dysfunctional lens index and that can be the criteria for assessment of these patients. This is another patient, in fact, improved subsequently after six months, MTF and uh, aberration profile. So this is how most patients would do uh, quite okay. In an early post-op, normally I don't dilate these cases because once you dilate, sometimes the ball changes and the near vision can get totally altered if lens doesn't go back to our same uh, position again. So this is a pupillary dilatation and constriction makes almost 150, 200 micron uh, shift in the ball in the IPCL cases. This may be because of a little bit of, uh, because Irido, IUL or IPCL contact, and especially a patient with a, a higher degree of refractive error. This is a, a star a, a EVO lens. The one result is there, a 34 I, six months, with very good outcome. We are awaiting this lens. Intraop complications similar to all the cases, except for a cataract formation, which may be more in this age group, if this is one of my patients developing cataract subsequent, you can see entire anterior subcapsular cataract is seen from a right from center to periphery. And you can see the BALT is only 47. The BALT is, is the major concern for all uh, cases, especially in the presbyopy age group. And surgery, I did cataract surgery for this patient and subsequently after cataract surgery, implantation of uh, multifocal lens gave a very good results. You can see 6.6 six and N6. And these patients uh, assess are very happy with the cataract surgery as we discussed. Their quality of vision is far better than a fakig IOL in these cases. To summarize, uh, presbyopic fakig IOLs is a good option for a, uh, a suitable uh, patient with a very good uh, pre-op assessment for these patients with the less internal aberration and DLI normal in these cases and better cornea. And uh, whatever results we have seen with the IPCL, uh, they do well. Patients adapt very nicely, and only concern for these patients is we know that presbyopia is uh, is a dynamic process. We are not sure what will happen after five years of implantation because I'm awaiting that period. Some of my patients are reaching five years now. One patient I have to add uh, correction for near the lens was clear, so that may be situation in uh, these cases. But I'm pretty sure with the Reflective, reflective design patient will get adapted to a larger age group range from five to 10 years also. Complications are very, very less. I yet to see any patient in glaucoma in this age group. Only cataract is a major problem for these cases. Thank you for your kind listening and uh, happy to answer questions. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Titya, uh, have you ever thought of doing a little, uh, leaving a little uh, residual myopia error in the non-dominant eye that kind of play have you tried so that to make them even more happy? That's question one. The question two is you've done in, you say myopes, you would do that. Uh, since they have also got larger pupil and this is a refractive, diffractive design, don't you think glare, they definitely they would complain about glare. Would that not be an issue? And, okay, uh, I'll answer your second question first. Yeah. Uh, amongst the around, I have done around, uh, uh, around 62 bilateral cases now. I do have around 15 to 18% of cases complaining of uh, halos and glare, especially now, you know, uh, night driving. But uh, these patients have got adapted to a situation. So it's not very, very a significant problem for most of these patients, considering the advantage they uh, get uh, with these lenses. And as far as... Uh, the cases I have done, most patients are uh, uh, of a higher degree of refractive error. There, I have not tried uh, the type of micro morovision uh, cases. It may be a good option for those patients who are uh, non you know, refractive error patients, hematropic patient getting to press myopia, or a patient who had a low degree of myopia because they always are very unhappy with whatever we do. Their little micro monovision might suffice uh, better, but I have no experience in that regard. If uh, Kamal can answer, because he also does uh, these. Oh lenses. yes, Kamal. Yes, yes, sure. No. Okay, I think it has it has beautifully summarized, uh, Doctor Tetyal. I couldn't probably add a word to what you said. You know, oodles of information you were giving out there. But yes, I do try to give a slight myopia in these patients by 0.5 in one eye, which is normally 
So I am talking about uh, not giving a higher near ad. Let's say if a patient requires, he's around 50 years and he's using plus 1.5. So I would definitely give two in one eye. But would I give 2.5 in the other? No. I would just make the other eye a little bit more myopic, which means, let's say that the patient is hemotropic and he requires two, I would give him a plus 0.5 on a spherical level and a near add of two. So I have seen, I've done five of these cases with one eye slightly bumped off for uh, myopia for distance, not an added uh, enhanced near add. And these patients, mm, nearly four and a half, five years, they're doing well. In fact, one of my OT technicians is doing great. And he was one of my first few patients. I've also used this lens in a lot of pseudophagic patients as a piggyback. I got a few samples to start with. And even those patients are doing well. I do agree with Dr. Tityal. These patients are more prone to have a little bit of higher incidence of cataract. Doing a Tracy uh, dysfunction lens mapping DLI index is definitely mandatory for these patients. If I have a DLI index of less than 6 or 6.5, I do not consider these patients. Apart from this, I guess a little bit of glares and halos, yes, higher than my normal uh, multifocal lenses. But overall, I think it's, it's a good uh, level of satisfaction provided your filtering uh, process is uh, very tight. It I needs to be tighter than your normal refractive correction. I think it's also important to center these lenses like multifocal IOs on the put and all that. No? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm going That's to a go on very important it. point. <laughs> have they, uh, do you have any experience of uh, purely correcting the near near vision? Like patient is emetro, they want, maybe in one eye if you do this um, press biopic correcting lens, yeah, that will sense. also help. Kamal seems to have an answer. Yes, Kamal? <clears throat> yeah, I, I have three patients like that where the patients were press biopic and I was told by the company that, you know, you could just correct one eye and see if it works. And I chose the non-dominant eye. Three of these patients, they two years, I think the longest follow-up I have is two years. These patients are doing decently well because just correcting one eye and not touch the mm -hmm. other because patients are in the age of... How much, 40, near, eye? How much near eye do you give them? 1.5 approximately. For, I have a patient who's 47. This lady never wanted to wear glasses. So I just gave a near ad of 1.5 in one eye. And she's doing pretty well and she's very happy. You know, she goes for parties and she can read the menu and, you know, play, play the, in a restaurant, play card. So she's very happy. So she got me two of her friends where I operated. And, you know, but I think doing one eye, the case has to be very, very selected. You need to tell the patient that, you know, the, the optical quality for near vision is not going to be as good as you expect. It's only one eye working. And if the patient is complying with all your, you know, pre-operative counseling, I think it's a good idea to do one eye in the other patients. This is more, of a, more of a people. clarification. This is more of a clarification with Dr. Titial. Actually, that I've been using these fake intraocular lenses for a long time. I was wary of doing it for presbyopia. Only after hearing one of your talks uh, sometime back, I ventured into it. And... Uh, what I find is that, you know, the company, what is available now, IPCL, is from <laughs> 1.5 to 3.5. But even a plus 3 diopter trifocal lens has only plus 1 diopter for intermediate and plus 2 diopters for near. So the first lens I, I was in a 45-year-old, I put a 2.5 diopter and he was not quite happy with the near vision because that was not quite adequate. So though the lenses are available from 1.5 to 3.5, now, whenever I'm using these lenses, even in the younger age group, is only a plus three diopter lens. Add because simply yeah. because that itself gives only plus two diopters for near vision and one for intermediate. Uh, what's your what is a your usual go to power as far as these lenses are concerned? You are actually correct. Uh, I've also gone to the highest power uh, concern for that. But in fact, two point five to three diopter is my choice for all patients. I never go less than two because it doesn't give any advantage at all. Right. I've seen my initial uh, cases, one or two patients I implanted and patients were uh, absolutely unhappy because their oh. near vision was as good as nothing uh, to yeah. begin with. Then I said, I'll go for was, a full you know, correction. The patient, the patient is wearing 1.5 ad. So you think, okay, yeah. you'll give him plus two ad. It doesn't work. You have to give them a plus work three ad. Yeah. 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 I'm going to go on to Can the next go? speaker. Yeah, just, so, just one okay. question. Just, just for my clarification. 
when you do this in one eye, do you give a monovision contact lens trial before you embark on surgery for these patients or you straight away go ahead and do the surgery? I think Kamal can answer. I have not yeah, done okay. this. So what we do is, first of all, we find the dominant eye and then we find what is the lowest refractive error for near eye which this patient is okay with at an intermediate <clears throat> And based on that, I, I have done 0.5 over correction. And these patients are good to go. You know, what they're mostly looking at is not a very good near vision. You, they've had a good counseling time. So what we give them is a decent intermediate vision. And in a decent uh, mesopic condition, most of I, these three ladies I'm talking about who just, I've done one eye each, they're doing great. They're very happy. It's been two, two years plus and they're doing very well. Yes, uh, Sri Ganesh? Yeah. Um... Just, I want to talk about my experience. I have not used presbyopic phakic IULs, but in older patients over 40, what I do is I plan for a monovision of about 1.75 diopters. And most of these patients wearing contact lenses already are wearing monovision contact lenses. The high mm -hmm. myops wearing monovision contact lenses, they're already neuroadapted, used to it. So all you have to do is do a monovision uh, with a phakic IUL. And with a phakic IUL, they actually get improvement in best corrected vision. So they are extremely happy. And they don't have night vision problems. If you put a presbyopic phakic IUL, they have night vision issues. If you undercorrect them in one eye, uh, if you have a defocus with a diffractive optic, then the uh, glare and halos are much more. So I would not suggest undercorrecting them in one eye with a presbyopic uh, diffractive uh, phakic IUL because it's going to worsen their uh, night vision and dysphotopsia. So I, I prefer to do a monovision with... Uh, uh, ICLs and these uh, these patients are extremely happy. After a good variety of uh, options which have come to us for the press biops, let's go on to our next speaker, Dr. Sanjay Chaudhary, who heads I7 Chaudhary Eye Center Group of Hospitals, a very leading cataract refractive surgeon of our country. And he is going to tell us something realistic also, phakic IUL complications. So let's hear from him. Thank you, ma'am. So, uh, we have discussed a lot of pros and cons about the fake IVLs. So, let me take you through some complications, some common and some uncommon complications. Cataract, of course, you all talked, but why I'm trying to show you this slide is the discussion that a low vault or a place where the fake IVL is touching the interior surface of the crystalline lens is liable to create a cataract. So here you can see the low vault and uh, and when I dilated the pupil you can see the entire profile of the ICL in the center it's a very shallow vault at the periphery it is touching here now we have boy, in a dilemma this is a very old slide almost about 12-13 years old slide when we were in a dilemma what should we do should we take out this lens and put it by a lens which is one size higher or let it be. The patient was so satisfied that we decided to continue. We called it for a one-year follow-up and this is on the fifth follow-up. At five years, he developed at this point a small speck in the anterior capsule and on a dilated examination, you can see an anterior subcapsular cataract. Now, at that time, again, we were in a dilemma. Can we stop the progress of this by changing to a higher size and increasing the vault? Or should we let it be because the patient is so happy and it is not in this opacity is not in the center? Why should we manipulate? So we let it be. And uh, I don't have that third slide now, but at about 10, 11 years post the initial surgery, the patient did develop a significant amount of cataract and we had to do a cataract extraction. So he lived 11 years very happily with this. At that time, uh, when I operated on him, he was about 25. Now he was about 36, getting closer to the press by peak age. So maybe I felt that I did the right thing by not actually changing his lens at the first instance. But of course, it is a subject of debate. Lots of people, the experts do believe that it is wiser to change it in the initial stage so that the patient may enjoy a better vision for even more than 11 years. The, the question is always about equestasis. That is one of the 
chief cause of a cataract developing under the icl and a central hole has done, done wonders to all this so we have discussed that in detail now here is another very interesting situation visco on the crystalline lens so when we see these slides like this we say oh there is a visco on the lens and it will slowly go away and in many a situation it does so this slide you can see on the left is a slit lamp on the right is a diffuse thing uh, a deposit or we felt that this is this is again a very old slide about 6 uh, 7 years back we thought it's a visco on the crystalline lens and we followed it up and in about 3 months it almost faded away without any visual loss so we were pretty happy that visco did come and go but then we thought that if visco is getting deposited why not encourage doing icls without visco that is when we entered in a heavy way in doing hydro insertions of icls and in the hydro insertions we came across this situation once again if you see the right slide it looks as if there is visco on the crystalline lens i said now where does this visco come from and the left side again there is a little uh, faint deposit on the crystalline lens now that we are doing a hydro insertion where is this coming from so uh, we were taken a little by surprise that we need to have some other answer for this kind of a situation but then at day 10 again on the left side you see on the slit this opacity started dissolving on the right is a diffuse image of this started dissolving and at 30 days also it had almost gone off with hardly any visual defect so we were satisfied but we really couldn't find an answer till again we had another situation hydro insertion and this kind of a deposit on the crystalline lens now at that time we uh, octs were there with everybody and uh, we did think of doing an anterior segment oct at in these patients to see what is happening so this was the first post op day such a big deposit and at 6 months the periphery had almost cleared up you see this and this opacity had kind of concentrated in the center as a ring and when we took an oct picture the the vault is very good now this is the anterior capsule this line here is the epithelial layer which appears that this is causing a proliferation or vacuolation of this epithelial layer and a cataract with a central large vacuolar area so this is definitely subcapsular and not in front of the capsule so this was then we looked up the literature and we found a paper which was a a a mind opener it very clearly said that in implantable coulomb lenses after the irrigating procedure through the narrow space between the icl and the crystalline lens that means if you are very vigorous and you want to irrigate under the icl for some reason and uh, the result shows on oct bleb like lesions in the anterior subcapsular capsular space sir so you one minute what is called sorry one minute no no it's okay yes yeah so you have a vacuolar kind of a reaction in the in the subcapsular area and we found in our uh, cases in the last case that first it was diffuse flat all across the anterior capsules sub anterior capsular 
and then it cleared up from the periphery, got accumulated in the center. So if you look at this slide, initially it was spread all across, a diffuse, even whitish haze under the anterior capsule. And over a period of time, the periphery cleared up and it kind of humped up in the center as it appears in the left eye. So from what in this you have to learn is that you should not irrigate in the space between the crystalline lens and the ICL. Avoid it as much as you can. In fact, it should be a totally out of bound area. And if you can get away with the least amount of irrigation in the chamber when you're putting in a fake IOL, the better. So that is why now my current technique is that I use a visco in my injector because that gives me a controlled injection. I still do a hydro insertion. Then there's a little visco in the entire chamber, both in front and behind in about five to six seconds with a bimanual irrigation aspiration camera. I remove the visco in front of the ICL. I do not go behind the ICL at all to take out that little bit of residual visco. And fortunately for the last few months, we have not faced a situation of these subcapsular vacuolar changes. They could happen again. I don't know when I do get it, I would definitely report it. So this is just to show that uh, when you use a visco, you tend to aggressively remove the visco and the recommended time is almost one minute, both in front and because the visco is also behind, you try various techniques. This is what we were trying at one time when you are trying to push the irrigation through the central hole. And uh, we thought that was a great idea to get the visco out from under the ICL. A thing we would not dare to think of now. At that time, see what, what uh, I was doing and a couple of other people were doing. And we thought we have got all the visco out, not realizing that this jet is hitting the interior capsule. And this is the kind of a watermark, we called it at that time, on the interior capsule. This totally disappeared in, in about one to two days. But the idea is please avoid irrigation in a fake IOL as much as possible. Here's another very unique condition, a pigment storm. Now, this was such a new thing, not mentioned anywhere in the literature. Huge amount of pigment coming out from the central hole, blurring the vision. The vision suddenly dropped from 6.6 to 6.36. And we were surprised. Now, what is this? I'm going to play the video again. We called it the pigment storm. See the way the pigment is coming from behind the ICL space, through the central hole, into the, into the front area of the ICL. The surgery was uneventful and this happened approximately 15 days after an uneventful ICL surgery. We probably, since it was coming in from behind to front, we attributed it to a pigment release from an area where the ICL was rubbing the root of the iris or the ciliary body and causing a lot of pigment release and probably some kind of a cyclide. So we put this patient on cycloplegics and breadfort, and in two days time, just in two days, it recovered. And this video is about uh, four months back and we have not had a relapse. Now this is just a conjecture, a speculation that the, the root of the iris or somewhere there was a lot of pigment release on the 15th day. I have not been able to see any literature which is giving me an explanation on this, but it responded very well to cycloplegics. A high vault, we you already discussed conclude, in detail. Dr. Rajesh, I'm sorry, Dr. Sanjay, you have to conclude. Yeah, so a high vault, I'm not talking about much. We have discussed, hallows, we have discussed. Uh, 
smaller uh, toric rotation we have discussed. And uh, I think with that, I'll conclude the talk. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, very interesting uh, uh, talk and different things which you brought out to our notice. I would uh, take question uh, your question along uh, with after Sri Ganesh's talk, uh, so that he's already is too late. So our last speaker, but not the least, and the hero is Dr. Sri Ganesh, who's the chairman and managing director of. Uh, a Netradama group of hospitals, a very innovative surgeon with many innovations to his health. And he is going to bring out his genius by talking on cataract post fakic IOs. On to you. Uh, thank you, Chitra. Just a minute. I'll just get my presentation up. Uh... Do we take one question with uh, for Sanjay's case? Okay, yeah. I am ready. Okay. So, uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, I would like to thank Dr. Chitra um, and ARC for inviting me to this uh, excellent program on fakic IVs, where a lot has been covered and learned. Uh, I'll be talking on cataract in post fakic IVs. Um, now, there, uh, if you look at the incidence of uh, cataract in uh, after uh, ICL, the incidence in the V4 was about one to two percent. Uh, as uh, reported in the FDA study, but uh, with the V4C, with the center flow, the incidence is uh, probably less than 0.2%. It's very low. And uh, especially if you have a good vault, then um, it is less. The reasons can be uh, because of uh, atrogenic trauma during the <coughs> procedure or a very low vault, um, which is touching the uh, uh, crystalline lens. And normally you get a anterior subcapsular cataract. You can also get some amount of uh, nucleus sclerosis because in myopes, some amount of uh, early nucleus sclerosis is uh, expected. Uh, and in the other types of fakic oils, like the varicize, you see more of nucleus sclerosis than the anterior subcapsular. In the ICLs, uh, it is typically um, subcapsular, uh, anterior subcapsular cataract. Uh, so I'll just show you three cases. Uh, well, if you look at the incidence, I mean, the etiology and uh, in, uh, incidence in uh, which are the patients who are more prone, IELTS more than 15 diopters um, are more prone for uh, cataract, age over 45 years and a low vault, uh, vault less than 100 microns. So I will show you three cases of uh, cataract in uh, post ICL uh, situation and uh, how I manage them. I have no financial interest. This is uh, a case which I did recently. Uh, you can see that there is an anterior subcapsular cataract. I make a 2.8 mm incision and a trapezoid incision that helps delivering the ICL easy, easily. I put in viscoelastic, go under the ICL with the viscocalina itself and then just nudge it into the anterior chamber. Then I use the same holding forceps, grab it in the optic haptic junction and with a twisting motion, this is very important slight rotation and a twisting motion, you're able to pull the whole lens out through a 2.8 mm incision. It's better not to extend the incision, otherwise you can have iris prolapse and a leaky wound. So it's better to remove it through the 2.8 mm incision. And then you continue with uh, capsulorexis. You can see that there was a little spider sign there. Um, that's because the zonules are weaker in these high myopic patients. And once you complete the rexis, then uh, that's the hydro. These soft nucleases uh, can be prolapsed into the chamber. I'm uh, using a, a centurion. I keep the IOP at 20 because I don't want the uh, AC to deepen uh, suddenly. And under topical, it can be quite uncomfortable if uh, you use a high IOP. So there's a 20 IOP. And uh, these uh, cataracts are quite soft. They can be evacuated uh, uh, mainly with... Uh, just vacuum, you don't have to use much of uh, FACO energy and uh, surgery itself is quite fast. Um, Pre-op assessment is very important. You will have to look for look at the macula. Some of them may have myopic degenerations or uh, macular hemorrhage, which can um, again be a problem post-op if you don't do the assessment properly. You also have to do a specular to look at the endothelial cell count. Here I'm using a single piece, uh, I mean, a three piece IOL. This is the uh, Acris of Expand series plus one adapter. Most of these 
High myopes need a very low IOL power, mm -hmm. which are available only in three-piece lenses. Mm -hmm. As far as biometry goes, you don't have to use any uh, special uh, uh, nomograms. If you're using a optical biometer, I use the IOL Master 700 with the Barrett's uh, formula. This is a second case where I'm using the femto. So when you use the femto here, I'm using the catalyst. After docking, what happens is usually there's an error message uh, because uh, it's not able to identify the surface fits and it identifies the anterior surface of the fakey eye well as the anterior capsule. So you'll have to do the settings manually. You set the pupil um, margins and then even the uh, anterior surface has to be shifted down from the anterior surface of the ICL to the anterior surface of the crystalline lens, the cataract. So this is what I'm doing here. If you don't do that, then it will incise the fakey eye well. So once you uh, set it in both meridians and confirm that uh, it is okay, then you can verify uh, all the parameters. Sometimes the pupil is a little small and then you may have to change the pupil size or use uh, pupil maximized. Uh, and uh, in this case, I have, once I've uh, done the fitting, this is the most important uh, point here that manual fitting of the surface anterior uh, surface of the crystalline lens and once you have done that then you can verify uh, all the surfaces and parameters and uh, here you can see again because of the pupil size i've kept a 5.2 mm rexis i use a pupil maximized to center it and then uh, i go ahead with firing the laser for the capsulotomy and the nucleotomy. And then I shift the patient uh, to the microscope. Uh, I make a side port 1 mm incision and a 2.8 mm incision. This is again uh, a trapezoid incision. So when you make a funnel shaped trapezoid incision where the inner lip is slightly large, about 3 mm, then it's very easy to remove the lens. Then put in viscoelastic yeah. under the lens, lift it up gently, and you, you want to go with your ICL loading forceps, grab the optic haptic junction, and with a twisting motion, you can easily pull the lens out. So the explantation is uh, quite easy. Uh, it's very important that you use a forceps to complete the rexus because sometimes there may be tags, especially post fake IOL when you do the capsulotomy. And then here I'm using a visco chop technique where I inject visco into the uh, nu nucleotomy grooves to separate the soft cataract. So this is a technique which I described uh, and published. And then you can just aspirate the uh, fragments very easily. There is some amount of nucleus sclerosis in the center. So this is something you can expect in myopic patients. Uh, especially if uh, they are older. And then, uh, of course, here, uh, again, uh, some people may be concerned about the biometry. If you're using ultrasound, again, no need to make uh, much of uh, alteration because uh, there's not much of difference. So no need for any adjustments. And with an optical biometer, no adjustments at all. And here we are injecting a single piece uh, IUS into the capsular bag. So managing uh, these uh, cataracts post ICL is quite easy if you know the technique and the results are quite good. Um, this was a case of FACO with ICL in situ. This, was, this patient was a high uh, hyperope and uh, here we decided to keep the ICL as a piggyback lens. He had uh, 13 diopters of uh, hyperopia and we used a 21 diopter uh, uh, ICL and uh, he developed a cataract after uh, two, three years. So he required a 45 diopter lens, but then uh, we decided to keep the ICL as a piggyback lens. And uh, uh, with that calculation, um, we Seven used a 30, 30 diopter lens. So here I go under the ICL and I'm just using the IA to aspirate the cataract. He had nanophthalmos also, 17 point something axial length. 
So here the ICL remains in situ. You can go in and remove the cataract and the and then put in viscoelastic. And then I'm inserting a, a single piece lens, the 30 adapter lens, into the capsular bag. Settle the IOL into the capsular bag, and after that, you can uh, you can just place back the haptics uh, in the sulcus. That's the ICL again, which I'm placing back in under the iris in the sulcus, and this acts like a piggyback IOL. This patient had a very good correction. Uh, we also have a formula on how to calculate uh, the IOL power, and it's being published in the. Uh, American Journal of Ophthalmology case reports is accepted for publication. Um, we can discuss more about the biometry if there is time on how to do biometry for such cases. Thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions? Uh, yes, wonderful talk. Before I take your question on the biometry of uh, uh, these patients, one other question I would want to ask you. These are patients who have been very happy with the uh, independence of glasses and after doing mm -hmm. a cataract surgery in very high myopes, you may not have the right multifocal IOL at all times uh, if you're looking at the imported segment. So then how do you take care of them? Do you do that uh, monovision? Uh, yeah. I would I would do a monovision of about uh, two diopters. Uh, uh, keep, make the non-dominant eye about two diopters myopic because one 1 1.5 diopters will not be adequate. So about two diopters should give them uh, fairly good intermediate uh, vision. I tell them that uh, you will have fairly good intermediate vision and then the near vision you may have to use... Uh, glasses because they need a much higher uh, plus add the high myopes to read uh, and with this they are fairly happy because even if you have like one 1 1.5 adapters myopia these very high myopes they are still able to read 612 618 in that eye and they're fairly happy so this is uh, how i plan it for the high myopes and of course the question on biometry with the ic in the eye how do you calculate See, basically, you will have to see, this was a patient who had uh, um, 13 diopters of uh, uh, hyperopia. So he had plus 13 diopter spectacle uh, correction. And um, uh, the maximum um, hyperopic ICL was 21 diopter. So we implanted a 21 diopter. And he had a residual power of plus 4. Um, so, uh, in, in 13 diopters, four diopters has been corrected. So, we kept, while doing the biometry, we kept the target. So, the ICL has corrected nine diopters of hyperopia. So, we kept the target uh, emetropia as plus nine. So, while calculating, you put it as plus nine. Uh, if you put it to zero, we got a 45 uh, diopter IOL. 45 diopter is not available. You'll have to get it manufactured. Uh, so when you put plus nine, it showed uh, an IOL of uh, 30 diopters. And so we implanted the 30 diopter lens and then he was emetropic with uh, just a three fourth uh, diopter of cylinder. So this is how you go about the calculation. And um, I have a formula for that also that's uh, being published in the AJO. Uh, that's good. Uh, very good uh, discuss, uh, talk, uh, Sri Ganesh. A lot of Thank learning. You. And one question uh, to you, uh, Dr. Sanjay, I mean, most of the things got discussed in the course of the webinar. Uh, now, if you have a residual power after a phakic IOL and the IOL, uh, a phakic IOL, and it is rotationally stable, uh, but you have a residual power. So now would you think of removing the uh, ICL or IPCL or would you do biotics for these patients? If the patient- I, mean, I think it's not a great idea to go in and change the whole system. If the system is stable, let it be. If the cornea is healthy and can support a little laser, and these numbers are usually very low, then we may just do a surface ablation. It works so well. Uh, any other question by the expert panel to Dr. Sanjay for his one case on pigment dispersion and uh, the other situations? Have you people uh, seen a, something like a small optic capture when you are doing... A, IPCL placement in a keratoconus uh, uh, patient. Have anybody seen that? How have you all managed those situations? 
One question with Dr. Sanjay. Um, yes. Can I? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, have we done the, uh, the UVM in this particular case to see the sulcus if there is anything uh, uh, which is there? Uh, like uh, uh, Dr. Rajesh was also saying that if there is chance of iris cyst or anything like that uh, in the sulcus. We don't have a U. And uh, because that could be one possibility or uh, maybe the haptic has uh, uh, rubbing or maybe tilt of I ICL or IPCL, whatever it, is, it was, which was uh, in one direction. Was the vault uniform all over? Yeah, it was uniform. One Absolutely question uniform. I have, Dr. Yeah. Sanjay. Yeah. Uh, did you do a PI in this case, surgical PI? No. Okay. It's because just two things come to my mind. One is a cyst which got ruptured. As Dr. Purendra said, me and Dr. Mm -hmm. Chitra were thinking about that. So UBM could have probably solved the problem. Or yeah. maybe if you did a PI and, you know, there's a late leak which got collected there due to viscoelastate. And now since the viscoelastate is gone and slowly the probably the, the pigment release from the PI is coming in. That's what one thing coming to my mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, was it only pigment or uh, there was a, a flare and cells also? Only pigment. Huge amount of pigment. That's it. It was like a pigment burst. Anaga, you have anything to ask, Anaga? Yeah, sir, ma'am, uh, I was just thinking excellent uh, learning actually here. Uh, Dr. Sri Ganesh's sir's uh, video about the cataract and the fakic I had a case where this, I think this was an ICL, sir, right? Or IPCL. Yeah, so. You are muted. Yeah, unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. This, was, this was an ICL. ICL, yeah. So I had a case similar with uh, to this. So it was an IPCL and there, uh, initially I thought because it's thicker and more rigid, maybe I would have to extend the incision. So I did the uh, FACO underneath the uh, IPCL. And then mm -hmm. when I was trying to remove it, I thought I would try it before, without extending and it came out very easily through a 2.8 only. Even without the uh, you know internal lip trapezoid thing that you showed, no, the only thing is I used a hand-on-hand -hand technique where I used two uh, forceps, two forceps, so I very gently removed it. So I don't know whether ICL, if it's thinner, could also come out through a simple two point. Yeah, most of the fake ICLs uh, would come out through a two point eight. Now, why the trapezoid is because when you have a trapezoid, when you have like a funnel. Uh, mm -hmm. shaped incision, the delivery is much easier. The stress on the cornea is right. less. So if you go back and look at your video, you will see stress lines uh, at the edge of the internal lip. And mm -hmm. there can be some amount of tearing of the internal lip. So the wound may not be that stable. Plus you have more stress on the cornea. So if you make that slight trapezoid kind of an incision, mm -hmm. then it's so much easier to deliver and you don't have stress on the cornea. Right. Uh, One point... Point. One point I'd just like to add to what Sridhagane said is, it's a good idea to hold the IPCL or ICL from one corner. The normal tendency would be to pull it from the center part of that the flange of the haptic. If you hold it from one center, it tends to automatically start folding and becomes a conical thing as it comes out. See, if you hold the haptic, the haptic is very thin. So there is a tendency for the haptic to tear when you're pulling it. So ideal... The thickest part is at the optic haptic junction, which is the rim of the optic. And that is where you have to catch the lens. And if you catch the lens there, then you can easily twist it and remove it very smoothly without any damage, without any stress. And one more point would be not to, I would not recommend using a tooth forceps, because especially with the ICL, it tends to bite through and tear the tissue, uh, tear the material. A good idea would be to hold it with the Macpherson, Macpherson and then, you know, yes, yes. Hand, on, uh, hand on hand technique, then with a needle holder. But uh, using the tooth forceps would tend to bite through and cheese wire the ICL for sure. With the Macpherson, there's a tendency for it to slip. So the ICL loading forceps is ideal because it's got that yeah. the ridges. So you get a very nice grip on the ICL and you can very easily remove it. So that uh, is my I technique. Which I, 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 I use an I, 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 uh, I will cutting forceps. So that means a forceps uh, is there which holds the IUL when you cut it. Those forceps have a very good grip. So just go in the center, hold it and pull it out. It just comes as if there was no effort at all. 
the grip is very nice so before we conclude patha you had a question yeah yeah not a question just uh, you know mr ganesh's talk was very nice and just for completion sake uh, when we used to do the artisan iols the artisan fake iols so a cataract with an artisan fake iol a little different in the technique because the artisan would be 5.5 or a 6.5 so that would have to come out and it's a rigid iol so that would have to come out through a 6.5 incision so once that incision it comes out then you have to suture the incision go temporarily well, i'll just give you my technique because mm -hmm. i couldn't show that video because of positive of time in 8 minutes uh, and most people are doing icl so i thought it's more prudent to show just icls because the varicize is uh, i think most people have stopped but i still have uh, patients with varicize coming back they come with nucleus sclerosis so what i do is i make a temporal clear corneal incision and then do the phaco do the capsular excess phaco under the uh, very size phaco iol and then once i completed the phaco and then close the uh, incision hydrate the incision then i go superiorly make a scleral tunnel and then remove the icl that is much better and a smoother surgery now if you make a scleral tunnel remove the icl and then try to do phaco it's very complex because the iris keeps prolapsing your chamber doesn't maintain you have more trauma so the best way to do it is Uh, make a clear corneal incision go under the uh, fake iol do the cataract that also acts like a protection to the endothelium i think so what the, doctor was trying to hint is that we make a superior scleral corneal incision remove mm -hmm. the lens and suture it up and then go through no, a temporal clear uh, corneal uh, incision and do the phaco that's uh, yeah. how it has worked and as far as removing the icl itself is concerned how it uh, the i mean i used to earlier used to uh, try with the lens holding forceps but it's somewhat a little too thick so i also go on to the macpherson's right now uh, fill in a little bit of cohesive viscoelastic don't bring the entire icl into the or the fake iol into the anterior chamber but just nudge one of the foot plates into the anterior chamber and go go in with the macpherson's hold it and then with the hand over hand technique uh, remove the entire lens it seems to Come out uh, at least uh, more uh, in a more organized manner in my hands in that way. And if you have the whole lens in the anterior chamber, earlier I used to try doing that. Then it's a little more difficult to handle the whole situation. If you nudge just one haptic, and then get hold of that and then bring it out, then it comes out. Uh, uh, yeah, the, when you when you when you remove the whole lens in the anterior chamber and you are trying to hold the lens, then there can be angle damage. So it is not advisable. So the technique I showed, I just nudge the uh, Right. Upper uh, haptic, and then just hold the optic haptic junction, and it is very smooth, very easy to remove. Right. Wonderful. Uh, so, Bartha, before I conclude, I have to. It's a, not a court martial. I have to give a dig at you. He said there's absolutely nothing left to discuss in fake IOLs. It's been done over the years, but we did discuss. See, there we are. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's been. So, my concluding remarks. It's been a very educative webinar. I'm sure for all of us. and it's so thanks so much to all the expert panel for being there right till the end although they kept messaging me they want to go but they didn't stay on so that was a double kapoor's dinner is already ready on the table that's a matter so what we never we just wanted him there so it's thanks a lot to you all and of course thanks to our wonderful speakers who were so crisp and clear and so relevant with what is needed and did not keep going round and round at all and of course thanks to my dynamic arc team and my wonderful uh, uh, co moderator dr anagha our thanks are always due to mr kripal and his aois admin team sai and manjula from neurotech who are always that back uh, back and support thanks are due to dr anand sethi and his team who you must have understood by now how they drive these webinars and our thanks to entod our main sponsors who have always unstintingly supported us and of course our attendance has been good as anand sethi has told me and uh, and it is this attendance of these attendees which aids us as arc as a team to keep coming back week after week with uh, different webinars and you you all of you really helped to make it a very successful one thank you very much thank, thank you, you thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.